Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Seng, and I will host this webinar with Dr. Kenneth Cornett today. I'm professor of the University Federal of São Paulo, or Federal University of São Paulo. And Dr. Cornett is professor of the Indiana University, and he's also chair of the Global Outreach Program of the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, or simply ASGCT. Before we start the presentation of the invited speakers, <clears throat> I'd, like, I'd like to deliver some messages about the organization of this webinar, which is supported by the Brazilian and American Society of Gene and Cell Therapists. But firstly, I'd like to thank the speakers who are set to participate in this webinar. Despite the very busy schedules this end of the year with COVID-19 treating our society, I also want to thank to Dr. Ken, who has supported this event since the beginning. I also want to thank the, to Samantha Kay and Beth Campbell. They are SDGCT staffs who has worked very efficiently to conduct the organization of this webinar. They have been very professional and collaborative. Thank you. I would also like to thank Dr. Paulo Brofman, who is the president of the Brazilian Society of Cell and Gene Therapy, and also Dr. Antonio Carlos Campos Carvalho, who is the director of the scientific committee to supporting this event. Now taking, talking about the clinical studies of gene therapy, we know that the first clinical trial of gene therapy was approved in 1990. It happened in the US and this trial was to treat patients with several combined immunodeficiency, which is caused by the, the deficiency of adenosine deminase, simply skid other. Today, 30 years later, approximately 3,000 clinical trials of gene therapy have been approved worldwide. And many of these uh, trials have already been completed, but still there are hundreds in progress. And since the first approval of the gene therapy drug in 2003, which happened in China, and to date, about a dozen of gene-based drugs have been approved in the world. And the majority of, of these drugs are from the last five years. And now, there are about 100 clinical trials of ongoing gene therapy trials in phase two and phase three showing them more gene therapy products may be launched in the coming years. This is a general scenario of gene therapy in the world. But the question is, how about in Brazil? <clears throat> in Brazil, like many other countries in the world, uh, the scientific and clinical experience of gene therapy is a little and recent. Brazil has had a long experience in cell therapy which include the basic science of our stem cells and the clinical studies. But gene therapy community is a small and young, but our groups are very active in basic research. And some of these studies have even managed to reach clinical studies. And a part of these experiments, this experience that we want to show today with colleagues from ASGCP who work in similar areas. <clears throat> Our first clinical studies of gene therapy took place between 2008 through 2010. This study was to treat the cardiac ischemia, and this study was coordinated by Dr. Renato Calio, who is a professor and the cardiovascular surgeon. My group designed and produced the vector, the vector and uh, this was used by Dr. Kalius group and who managed to treat about 10 patients with cardiac ischemia. The result of this study have already published in the journal Human Gene Therapy and the patients have experienced a very significant improvement temporarily. But this requires additional clinical studies to confirm these results. 
But important is for me, this experience was a very important milestone in demonstrating that we can design, we can produce vectors, and we can perform clinical studies at that time. Last year, Dr. Dimas Kovas group coordinated the first clinical study with CAR-T. CAR-T is that T cell engineered with the chimeric and target receptor to treat a patient with leukemia. In this study, Dr. Henato Cunha, who is one of the speakers of today, coordinated the clinical study, and he's gonna speak for us about his experience of this study. The important is that this drives another important achievement for us, especially for our Jintabi community. During some meetings that I had with Dr. Ken Coronetta, together with the ASGCT team, and Dr. Martin also participate, participated in some of these meetings, I expressed the importance of collaboration with ASGCT to promote further research in gene therapy in Brazil, mainly to create platforms for clinical studies of gene therapy and the vector production at the level of clinical use. Even though our country has excellent basic research groups with results and products that justify going to clinical studies and to validate gene therapy drugs, there are several bottlenecks. And one of these bottlenecks was the lack of regulation for clinical trial and the registration of gene therapy products. And another bottleneck was the lack of laboratories for vector production under GMP condition, as I mentioned before. Anvisa uh, is uh, the Brazilian federal government agency that controls our medicine. It's a kind of US Food and Drug Administration office. Anvisa created a special committee to elaborate regulations for advanced therapy products in 2016. Well, I'm part of this committee since its creation. As you know, the advanced therapy refers to gene therapy, cell therapy, and tissue engineering. Finally, at the beginning of this year, the regulation for registration of the advanced therapy products was approved. And still this year, Anvisa evaluated and has already approved two gene therapy drugs. Loxterna for liver syndrome and Zolgensma for spinal muscular atrophy. As evaluation of the advanced therapy product is a very complex process, complex process, Anvisa also created a national network of specialists in the advanced therapy, which we call Heneta. And this Heneta is currently coordinated by Dr. Adriana Carvalho. So now we have regulations and trained people to deal with uh, advanced therapy products. Another bottleneck is how to produce daisy gene therapy product drops for clinical trials. Gene therapy drops <clears throat> are quite different from the conventional drops for design and production. The gene therapy clinical trial itself is a bottleneck, especially for monogenic disease, because the medications for these drugs are made almost for personal use. <clears throat> for these reasons, this webinar is focused on clinical trials of gene therapy that Brazil has experienced recently. In order for this experience to be shared and collaborated, we invited ASGCT colleagues who are working in similar areas. So for ex vivo gene therapy for leukemia with CAR-T, we invited Dr. Renato Cunha from the Universidade de São Paulo and Dr. Richard Coya from the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. And for gene therapy for monogenic disease, we invite 
Dr. Margaret Ozello from the Universidad de Campinas, and Dr. Puna Malik from the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. As monogenic diseases are a major focus of research in gene therapy, we invited Dr. Tanya Felix from the Universidad Federal de Rio Grande do Sul, uh, who coordinated an epidemiological study of the Brazilian monogenic disease. And this study is supported by the Minister of Health, and she's going to talk about the current epidemiological situation of monogenic disease. As I said at the beginning, it was only at the beginning of this year the regulation for the registration of advanced therapy products was approved, which are considered a great achievement uh, for Brazilian society. To hear the long experience of American society for gene therapy and how regulation has evolved since the establishment, we also invite Dr. Maritza McIntyre from Stradio Bio. So I hope you enjoyed this webinar and thank you for your attention. I have a short message from Sam is, please type questions in the question and answer Q&A during the presentation. When all speakers in a session are done with their presentation, I and Dr. Corinetta will select the questions and read them aloud to speakers. So if you have difficulties hearing the meeting, please use the call in number in Brazilian region. Now I invite Dr. Kenneth Corneta, who is a chair of Global Outreach Program of ASGCT, to deliver his message, please. Dr. Hahn, thank you very much. Um, it's very exciting to uh, hold this uh, webinar today and I really appreciate all the help that, that you've provided. Um, what I'd like to do uh, just before we get started with the speakers is just present a couple of slides, a little bit about the society, but also realizing that we have quite a number of folks on the webinar and probably have different backgrounds just to get a little bit of information so that maybe we'll all be speaking the same language as we listen to the various talks which are going to range from basic science to clinical work to regulatory and other issues. Just a little bit about ASGCT. Um, we have about 4,500 members now. Um, it's been established 25 years ago um, and our annual meeting uh, Gets had over 6,000. And I, I hate to date myself, but I went to the first meeting. Um, it was not 6,000 people. It was much smaller, and it's amazing how it grows. Um, and our society has a number of journals uh, under uh, the lead journal, which is molecular therapy. Um, but our mission is basically to advance awareness and education related to cell and gene therapy with really the goal of, of alleviating human disease. Uh, actually, this Global Outreach Committee is new, and it was part of the 2020 uh, strategic plan. And we're really here to try to, um, you know, look outside, uh, excuse me, to look outside the US. Um, we've had collaborations with folks in Europe and other parts of the world, but really we want to step and, and really we have an international committee, but the global outreach has a different mission. And that's in some ways looking at equity, uh, no matter what country it is. Uh, many of the things we're developing in gene therapy are, are key diseases in a variety of areas around the world. And how to, as a society, make sure that we're able to provide this to the, the people who need uh, these therapies we're developing. One of the exciting things, uh, having been in the field for a long time and wondered whether we're gonna get to approved clinical products, um, we have some now, and we're really looking that over the next uh, 10 years, probably in the US for another 60 approved cell and gene products. So uh, it's a very exciting time as, as we move to this. But again, um, how are we thinking about making sure these are distributed globally? 
and I thought maybe just to take a few slides to talk a little bit about gene therapy and, and what are we talking? And, and I guess this is a definition that I've used uh, is, is gene therapy is the deliberate alteration of a cell phenotype with therapeutic intent. And when we're talking about this currently, we're generally limited to somatic cells. So we're trying to look to how do we improve an individual patient? We're really not talking gen genetic engineering of uh, embryos and, uh, and actually one of the FDA, at least in the US uh, requirements is that you actually show you're not affecting the germline. So you are just talking about treating a, a specific patient. And the ways we can do that, we may try gene addition, which is currently the most common approach that we're using. And we can use non-viral and viral gene therapies or mRNA uh, as we're doing for vaccines now for the COVID virus. Um, and here we're trying to take a genetic material and place it within a cell and have it expressed. And this is used to correct homozygous genetic diseases where both of the alleles um, are defective and we're putting in a good copy. Uh, CAR T's are re-engineering T cells by putting in new sequences. But there are other ways we can use gene therapy in disease treatment. And one might be disruption of gene products that are not, um, that are causing disease. Um, and we can do that through siRNAs, uh, zinc fingers, CRISPR technology now, where we wanna eliminate some genetic sequences, for example, in HIV to, to try to eliminate that in, in stem and T cells. Um, but we also might wanna disrupt oncogenes or dominant negative genetic diseases. And then finally, the where area which is very hot right now is in genetic modification in situ. So if we have a genetic disease, rather than add a good copy of the wild type um, version of that gene into a cell, we're actually gonna go in and correct the cell itself. And uh, for example, in sickle cell to revert that mutation back to the wild type and hopefully cure that disease and CRISPR, sleeping beauty transposons and other uh, zinc finger nucleases are methods that folks are, are evaluating that currently. Um, if folks are on the call or may not be very familiar with the types of gene therapy, um, the ones that'll be most commonly talked about today are related to viral gene transfer. And what I'm just trying to show here on the slide is that um, in non-viral, we can take plasmids and we know we can get them into cells. And there are some indications where we can do that to express it. Um, generally though, that expression is, is relatively short lived. Um, so it's not something that's often gonna lead to a lifelong correction of a disease. But if you were treating a cancer cells that you were trying to destroy, or you were trying to immunize against uh, an antigen, uh, this may be one of the approaches to go. In viral gene transfer, we've actually re-engineered viruses to express a gene of interest. And I'm just showing in this cartoon, um, we have here a uh, sort of cartoon of a virus. This would be a retrovirus where you have the gag pollen envelope. And we actually remove the vast majority of the viral sequences, keep those parts that allow that um, new construct to express our gene of interest but also can integrate into a cell. And what I've tried to show here is a cell um, that has a, a vector particle attached to it. It would uptake this in case of a retrovirus, it would reverse transcribe and then integrate into that cell and hopefully now correct that cell long-term. And what I showed at the bottom are some of the advantages and disadvantages. And I showed here the retroviruses and because it integrates the target cells are often cells that are expected to grow and multiply very much in vivo. So bone marrow stem cells, T cells, where we see expansion, we wanna know that there's stable integration of that sequence with into the, the nucleus of that cell. Now, the other area where um, is very interesting uh, in terms of gene transfer has been an adeno-associated or AAV virus. And these vectors um, are relatively small. So the package we have to sort of select uh, it generally does not integrate, but if you're looking at organs that don't turn over very rapidly, like muscle and liver and brain, there's a lot of interest in using these, um, these types of vectors, and they're in a number of clinical trials for a variety of different diseases. And so there are other, basically, if there's a virus out there, somebody's tried to look to see how they can make a vector out of it and what the applications are. So just like we don't have one antibiotic for all bacteria, we don't necessarily have one, 
vector system that is going to be for everything. We want to look at what is the disease, what is the cell target, do we need to get integration, and then look to see which might be the, the best vector for that application. I think for those who are thinking about developing a gene therapy um, as a research program, it takes a village, it's sort of an expression. Um, it takes a lot of resources to bring things from the bench to the bedside. And, you know, it, my own experience has been, you know, getting basic research grants from the, from the NIH in the US, but we also have had to turn to foundations and philanthropy. Um, as we're moving particularly into the clinic, these get to be pretty expensive endeavors. So we need to really look at what also can we tap into. And in the US, we have a number of national resources. Uh, the National Gene Vector Biorepository helps meet FDA requirements in terms of testing. And that's an organization that uh, I've been uh, running for the past 10 or so years. But we have other centers for primate research that help with gene therapy. And we even have a program that's helped with um, the clinical trials. When we're doing clinical trials, we often need hospital support, um, plus all of the above. Um, they need to be invested in this. And then, you know, we're going inter to interact with pharma, particularly when we move from an early phase study, which may be investigated or initiated within our institution. But as you go to phase three and licensure, you do need pharma to be able to take it over the sort of over that finish line to get it to be licensed and take to patients. Some of the things that you may hear today in the discussions may be around phase one, two, three, or four. If there are folks on the webinar who are not familiar with these clinical trial designations, just sort of not, you know, named it up here. When we're talking about phase one, we're predominantly looking at toxicity. Um, and again, these, these designations were initially developed to describe clinical trials around uh, drugs, uh, antibiotics, hypertension, um, so it, it, it's a little bit more difficult some, sometimes to gene therapy, but generally we do need to classify those. And those phase one studies are generally small numbers. It's really helping to find the dose and look at our, what are the side effects. As we move to phase two, we're looking at estimating what is the efficacy and if we have something we can compare it to, we'll look at that. Phase three is really where we're looking to say where we're gonna do this study. It's gonna be the pivotal study that may help us get approval and then eventually move to licensure. And now phase four is the, the product is already licensed, but are there some side effects that we hadn't anticipated in the earlier trials? And sometimes organizations will require additional testing and that does apply for gene therapy. Um, again, there's a number of challenges of bringing things forward, um, but when we have gene therapy, because they're not like other drugs. And so that does take a lot of interactions between investigators, clinic clinicians, and the regulatory agents to help define that. Um, there certainly are things that we need to try to advance uh, going forward. Uh, manufacturing technology and capacity is a major challenge. Uh, in Indiana University, we have a vector production facility and we're booking almost two years out because there's a lot of demand. Um, and these are challenging products to make. The upfront investment for many folks doing these types of trials can be can be fairly high. And then some of these are rare diseases. So um, what about patient recruitment? Um, and clearly there's other regulatory issues. Uh, and for example, many cancer trials, there isn't really a good uh, animal model. And while the drug companies have set up and regulatory bodies are looking at very specific animal models for efficacy, biodistribution, and toxicology, they often are not relevant to what we're doing in cell and gene therapy. And so again, it takes a lot of back and forth to try to develop things to show that your product is safe to be able to administer to individuals. Um, and again, the, even just certifying these vectors, um, they're still a, these, these recommendations are still evolving. I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but um, this is my wish list for Indiana University in terms of if we're going to take something from bench, bench to bedside, what kind of things do we need to do around, particularly around uh, cell and gene therapy products? And we really need to rely on the basic scientists to develop this. Um, and, and pharma is not always 
the, the areas that are doing this. Usually this comes out to research labs, like I'm sure many folks are working in who are on this webinar. Um, we need to not only have those basic scientists working here, but we need to work with clinicians. And so as we go from a target identification and we make a vector uh, or cell combination that we think will be important for treatments, we need to do those then important preclinical efficacy and safety studies to show that it's appropriate that we're gonna be able to treat patients safe, safely, um, at least to the best of our work preclinical. Then we're gonna to need to manufacture both that, that vector in a GMP or a good manufacturing practice manner. And then also the cell products, if we're taking doing ex, ex vivo cell products, they also have to pass a certain level of stringency in how those are manufactured. And then we're going to get into a clinical trial and hopefully go through the phase one, two, and then again, we'll start to, um, we'll need to, to go to a phase three and have a partner in industry to do that. That only takes these clinicians, but we need to have these resources here. Um, and then all along, it's important that we look for project management. What are the IP issues? You don't want to have that become a problem down the road. Um, and how are we going to face the regulatory environments? Um, and this all takes investment, not only for folks going out and getting grants and interacting with other folks, you know, the university does have to contribute to get this program going. Um, we, we sort of hold out that they hopefully they'll get money. Um, not everything here is actually in place in our institution, but I think, you know, one of the things that folks who are thinking about developing this at their own institution should think about you know, I might not be able to do everything, but where can I be an important part uh, within the research environment? Uh, Indiana University has been very invested in GMP manufacturing of retroviral and lentiviral vectors, and that's an area that we have concentrated on and hope to again expand. So if you're in the area thinking about this, think about where you might, you may not be able to do everything, but where can you excel? Just my last couple of slides, um, ASGC does have some patient education resources. So if you are seeing individuals or just for your information, wanted to know what kind of things to be able to share with patients who might be considering cell and gene ther therapy, um, the, the ASGCD website uh, can help you uh, with some of these uh, educational materials. And just again, mentioning this collaboration that we have today, um, and this has been uh, really, I think they've been so important to have Dr. Hahn and also um, Dr. Bonamino were really important at, at helping us get this organized. Um, but we're hoping to continue this and, and we will have a joint uh, session on gene editing at the annual meeting uh, in April. Um, but there are other opportunities here just listed. Um, and I will mention again at the end of the meeting, we will have uh, a survey to see how folks, uh, what they thought about the program today. But in that survey, please think about um, how else we might continue this collaboration. We would really like to hear from you on that. So my last slide here is just to thank um, uh, the folks, uh, Sam Kay and, and, and Betsy uh, Foster Campbell, who have really helped organize this. And here they have the contact information if you'd like to uh, reach out to them. Um, but again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hahn and also the speakers for agreeing to talk with us today. Uh, so thank you on that. Um, and I think we'll start now to get to the meat of the, the meeting. And the, I'd like to introduce the first two speakers. Um, the first speaker today will be Dr. Cunha. Um, he has a, a very impressive uh, background. He uh, graduated in medicine from the Federal University at Oberlandia, and he went on to get additional training. He specialized in uh, internal medicine, hematology and hematotherapy, and bone marrow transplant. Uh, he's been trained uh, both uh, here at, um, at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, he's also trained in Paris and did a postdoctorate in bone marrow transplantation and cell therapy at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda here in the US. Um, He's currently a, 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 the, a PhD professor at the School of Medicine at the University of Sao Paulo and coordinator of the bone marrow transplant and cell therapy unit. Uh, he is an associate member for the Brazilian Society of Bone Marrow Transplantation and the Brazilian Association of Hematology and Hemotherapy. 
And since 2015, he's been a member of the American College of Physicians and American Society of Hematology. The second speaker um, I'll introduce uh, in this, for this next session will be Richard Koya. Um, Richard is an Associate Professor of Oncology at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, um, at, uh, and, and, at, which is in Buffalo, New York. He's also the Associate Director of Cell for Immunotherapy, excuse me, the Center for Immunotherapy and the Director of the Vector Production and Production, uh, Development and Production Facility at that institution. He received his MD in, uh, and did his residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in clinical oncology in Porto Alegre, uh, Brazil. Uh, he then received his PhD in molecular biology and pathology at Hokkaido University in Japan. Uh, he went on to uh, do a postdoc and then became faculty at University of California in Los Angeles um, and then uh, has gone on to move to the Roswell Park Institute uh, in, in New York. Uh, he has had many awards um, and uh, will has been very active in the area of uh, clinical trials related to uh, T TCR regulatory uh, excuse me, TCL engineer T cell transfer for metastatic cancer patients. So we're looking to forward to both of those talks and I will turn it over right now to the speakers. Okay, hello everyone and good afternoon for, for the ones that in Brazil and the ones that in the US. I'd like to say um, thank you for Dr. Conita for this um, introduction and also to say thank you for the organizing Dr. Han and again Dr. Conita and everybody from ASGCT and ABT Cell Gene Therapy um, Societies. Thanks also to Sen and Betsy for the organization for the support um, with our talk today, okay? So um, I'm going to, I'm going to start to talk on getting the, the, the CAR T cells in a country as in Brazil and um, to see how uh, uh, the challenge is and how it's difficult to establish some kind of platform in a low mid income countries. So if I point some challenge here, I can say that we work in Brazil and that similar countries as us with a restricted budget. So the grants opportunities are not very very um, very high as in the US and Europe, for instance, restricted human resource to develop new technologies, delay to define regulatory aspects of advanced cell therapy, establish new GMP facilities to produce uh, and generate vectors in GMP conditions, but also to manufacture cells, translational research and clinical units and, uh, and clinicians with the expertise uh, need to. So I'm going to address as Brazil has a dealing with all these um, challenges that I listed here for you. But before that, I'd like to, to, to show you some initiatives uh, um, in Brazil. So in Inca, Brazilian uh, Cancer Institute, Martin Bonanin did uh, preclinical studies in Zipian Beauty Transplants on Vectors, in Campinas Institute, Unicamp, Bodrin II, um, Pedro Campos did for preclinical studies with CD19. Uh, there is some biotech uh, in collaboration with the hospital Albert Einstein, also working with CD33, CD123, and gene therapy in sickle cell disease. Uh, in, uh, us in Ribeirão Preto uh, Medical School working with CAR T cells, and many other um, groups has working also with the project to acquire the equipment and then to uh, validate the process from U10. So in this group, you have your first patient treated in Brazil that I'm going to show the data. And the other side, you also have the uh, industry, the farms that is trying to come to Brazil. Novar is the first one that announced already. They start the registration process with the CD19 and the Kira um, CAR T cells. And others, as Jens and Telgin, has announced also that they are interested to coming for Brazil. 
you would never heard anything about Juliet and Kite, but would not have any patient treated already, at least announced uh, treated patients from this group. We do have a clinical trial from a virus that currently is running in Brazil, but we don't have any data yet. So from Martin in Rio de Janeiro, he works with CAR T cell generated by sleeping beer transposon vectors. It's a non-viral non platform that um, the non-clinical data is already published and going on. I, I, I hope and I expect that very shortly this clinical trial will be launched in Brazil and start to, to, add, to recruit patients. So basically this is his platform, as I mentioned. He, he works with uh, sleeping beer transposon. It's a non-viral platform that it's a Brazilian technology that is, is being developed in Brazil. So this is very important for us. And the other side, and the, our side in Ribeirão Preto, we work with a 100 Brazilian technology platform. So here the idea is to design and validate new lentiviral vectors. And also before that, select new clones, identify new targets for clinical purpose. So we wanna, we wanna have patents from these SCFV fragments and the vectors. So we are able also to develop and move forward in terms of preclinical studies new translational research and focus from advanced cell therapy and uh, scale up and manufacture the lentiviral vectors. We have already a facility for that, for to produce vectors in GMP condition, manufacture CAR T cells. And it's a big challenge to, to have this in affordable cost for low middle income countries. So it's important to have our own technology and also to establish collaboration and lot of clinical trials. So this is an example. We have already selected some to the 123 SCFV fragments. It's a new ones to produce uh, new vectors and then register that is a, as a Brazilian patent. And also we are working on a viral um, production and processing GMP uh, facility. So we have improved this, this technology with some companies. There is a partnership and agreement to transfer technology for us and to start this facility to produce our own vector in Brazil. So this is an example um, of the design of a platform since the local ferries and collection and T-cell collection, then until the activation, then unification, until the quality control that you can deliver the, 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 the product to the patients or to the mice, depend on the, 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 the step you are working with. So, and then you can also um, produce and uh, generate the animal models to test and what you're working on the clinic and the clinical setting and also in the translational setting. So this is an example of three beds that you have production of lentivirus and GMP and condition where we were validating our GMP viral validation. This is the first three beds that we have done. So with uh, interesting tighter and also the delivery conditions was okay for us. And here working with health donors also in, the, in GMP facility in high scale volume to work with uh, the activation and then also the proliferation and the expansion of uh, the CAR T and also the transfection. So the first three health donors, you have a quite variation between the transfection performance, but to also you get this um, GMP and this uh, 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 translational um, data and also we again inject in the mice to see the potency in vivo and how this CAR T could um, kill tumor cells. And in here also we move forward more one step and now we recruited patients to, to give the cells and uh, select and process the cells. So you can see that uh, we have two independent donors here and there was a quite, a quite different performance of uh, transduction, but you are able to, to, to produce the CAR T to have enough cells based on the kilogram of the patient. And once you have the in vitro cytotoxicity, the potent tests here, the CAR T seems to be and so to be very effective against the malignant cells. These are all the, the criteria to deliver the product according to, according to Brazilian regulations. And uh, you can reach all the requirements to deliver the product. And that one, of, um, uh, one of the challenges of this phase for us was to deplete the, the non-T cells um, on our product. We didn't use until here magnetic selection for that. We just made performs the depletion with um, 
different sedimentation processes. This is something that you look at at any age and have performed a similar um, protocol here. This gave us the opportunity to produce the CAR T for a lymphoma patients without any magnetic selection based on the buff coat that they will have harvested during the uh, leucopharis process. So, and these patients was treated in a compassive um, scenario. The 63, 63 years old patient with a non Hodgkin diffuse large B cell lymphoma initially was a uh, 2B stage, but then the, 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 his disease was refractory and then start to be a progressive. First, second, and third line of treatments are not able to maintain or to control the disease. And the patients uh, uh, was recruited to, to, in fact, the patients asked us to collect the cells and test his cells with the T-cell manufacturing platform. So we were able to produce the CAR-T. He went to a fourth um, treatment and uh, with a polituzumab and then machine rituximab, but wasn't able to get in disease control. So after three cycles of this last schema, the patient progressed with the disease. So that's why you decide to bring the patient to the hospital. And uh, in September last year, uh, the patient was with us in the bone marrow transplantation unit and uh, was able to infuse the cells on September 9. So you can see the photos here where and the patients in the center and he and his family authorized all the images here. And you can see that 24 hours after the infusion, the patient get fever and also um, you start to change the level of your blood pressure. Uh, hypotension happened and the, and the cytokine storm too uh, appeared uh, five days after the infusion. All the inflammatory markers as a uh, uh, C reaction protein and ferritin also was very high. And then after the tocilizumab use and also uh, methylprednisolone, we, we, we were able to control the cytokine release syndrome. Was a great three uh, CRS that you reach. The lymphoma markers also start to go down and also the pain the patient had and all the, 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 the tumors also start to disappear. So after one week, we're able to detect the cartis in the blood 33% and that maintained after uh, the, the first detection that you had for more than one, more than one month. And here you can see that uh, 30 days after the infusion, the bone marrow transplantation before the infusion was totally um, uh, uh, occupied by the malignant cells. And then you can see that it's totally clear. So the bone marrow after the infusion 30 days was negative for malignant cells. And also the PET scan evaluation before, you can see a very spread and diffuse and uh, disease on mainly in the bones. And after that, the patient reached the remission. The only exception was a bone um, femur lesion here that is the, 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 it was almost the same of the liver. So it was uh, some kind of uh, three or four uh, Deville score. So coming back to my first slide, you can see that to bring and to uh, arrive until to treat patients, met chines are, 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 you have to face many different chines. So how you have deal, dealing with all this in Brazil. For a restricted bird, you had a very nice uh, news recently, this year, three, two months ago. Uh, it's the Genoma Brazil program. I'm sorry, my slides in Portuguese here, but that means Brazil has launched uh, genomic processes to sequencing more than 100,000 people in Brazil. And uh, in that you generate a platform and a database with genetic information, omics information in general, in fact. And all this data will be able to be translated in the disruptive, innovative treatments, including personalized medicine, CAR T cells, and gene therapy. So Brazil is moving forward with your federal government. It's a federal government initiative. But also you can see uh, some initiative from uh, the states in Brazil, like Sao Paulo state, uh, the, your uh, FAPESP is the uh, foundation that support the research in Sao Paulo State and had allowed many, many call for grants and also collaboration with the farms. And these are very interesting. New and other studies in Brazil uh, has also been doing the same. 
uh, for restricted human resource to develop new technologies, uh, we have is still to 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 perform more international collaboration. I mean, and also between the among the centers in Brazil, not only for the research scenario, but also for the manufacturing process. So I put here the example of the National Gene Vector Biorepository, because I like to take the advantage that Dr. Conner is here, so he could maybe talk a little bit more about this this uh, facility for uh, to that support the the research and the scientists in the US, so how that could be also done in Brazil, or if it's possible to establish any kind of collaboration, mainly to help with FDA aspects. So in terms of um, board resolutions, I mentioned a delay of the regulatory aspects, but in fact, the last years, uh, the Minister of Health in Brazil has launched three board resolutions that uh, regulated the aspect of uh, preclinical, translational, uh, clinical trials and, and cells, uh, cell therapy registration in Brazil. So in fact, in, in terms of uh, resolution and regulatory aspects, Brazil has many, has done many, many progress in this aspect. And to help to regulate everything, to design the clinical trials, and also to, 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 to evaluate the, the safe and the security of all the projects, uh, also, there is now a team of experts, a panel of experts that you evaluate all the clinical trials called RENETA, and they are able to evaluate all the clinical trials that I submitted for the Minister of Health and for Anvisa, it's our FDA equivalent in Brazil. So this group can give an independent um, uh, um, uh, comments and opinions about what's happening and the next step of this group also will be an educative process in base, uh, basically um, talking about and teaching how to deal with all these regulatory aspects and design clinical trials and preclinical -pre studies too. The other great challenge is establish new GMP facility, generation of vectors in GMP conditioning. We have the Butantan Institute initiative. Uh, it's a huge institute in Brazil that is um, uh, related to vaccine production. In fact, it's the biggest in the South Hemisphere uh, of the world vaccine production. And they have a collaboration with Ribeirão Preto, with our institute. And the, the proposal is to, to invest in, uh, in a new GMP facility for T cell manufacture, but also for generation of factors in GMP conditioning and also for translational research. And the aim here is to have our own vector for Brazil centers, not only for us, of course, but for the whole country in the South America and Latin America, and also to have the possibility to create new cells to be registry and licensed for the Brazilian um, government for our health public system too. So that's the main purpose of this collaboration. And clinical units and clinical and clinicians with expertise need to, I think here you have two main initiatives in Brazil. The Brazilian Bone Marrow Transplant Transplantation Society and also the Brazilian Hematology Society both has already your committees, has already your working parties to, to write and to, to establish the clinical indications, clinical management, and they are moving also in an educative scenario for the clinicians and research, and also then to, to create a, informative materials for the patients and your, your familiars. So we're trying to move in this aspect too, but we really need to, uh, to, to make more progress in this area too. So, and I, I, I'd like to, to finish with um, this photo. Uh, this is our team in Ribeirão Preto, just to mention, I always show this data and this photo to mention that it's impossible to perform CAR T gene therapy or all other advanced cell therapy alone. We need a very big team, a uh, multi-professional team, multidisciplinary team. So we have people here that work with the cell manufacturer. We have people that work with bone marrow transplantation, hematology, FRS, clinical care intensive unit, and go on. There's a lot of people working with all this. So we have to be very collaborative and look to the same place to to have something very productive and safe for our patients. So these are our partners and many partners from other um, 
others um, scientists and uh, institutes in Brazil. So I'd like to say thank you for all of them too. And once again, I will finish here. I'd like to say thank you for everyone and for uh, your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cunha. Um, and we'll next hear from Dr. Koya. Hello. So first of all, I, I would like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me for this very interesting, exciting um, meeting and, and time to start collaborating. Um, from my side, uh, I am really, really happy to, to be here. So today I'm going to um, talk about um, um, some considerations for developing uh, genetically modified T cell uh, therapies. Um, I, I would talk about um, uh, things that we did, um, how we started from scratch. Uh, basically, we didn't have even a facility to, to produce the, the products or, or, or diesel products and um, vector products. So, uh, and, and going all the journey to, to open a clinical trial, infuse patients and having uh, three clinical trials open uh, um, in, in this field. So let me go to the next slide. Those are my disclosures. So today, uh, basically, I would, uh, I would talk about the main engineered uh, T-cell platform. There are two of them, uh, broadly speaking. And then go um, right to the, the main uh, aspects of, of um, developing uh, gene-modified T-cell therapy. Um, in our case for cancer um, and uh, the scientific aspects, technical, regulatory, financial as well. Uh, of course, there are uh, too much things to talk about and I would take many, many hours to even for each one of those aspects. So I, I try my best to, to give you an overview of something that I think uh, is going to be useful uh, to think about uh, when establishing uh, a new program for um, for clinical uh, application and actually open clinical trials. And um, along the way, I, I will give uh, some examples from our experience here um, and our institution. So the two main uh, flavors, uh, if you will, of, uh, of a TCR or a CAR T cell therapy, which means the engineered T cell therapies. As, as Dr. Cunha mentioned, um, um, uh, there is, um, a CAR T cell, a chimeric antigen receptor type of T cell, where it's basically, um, as Dr. Uh, Cunha uh, mentioned in his experience, um, it's, it's an antibody to recognize a surface protein on, on the cancer cells. And um, um, uh, the, uh, the, the single uh, chain fragments, variable fragments, are then docked into a um, contract that has a transmembrane domain or stimulatory uh, domains could be a CD28 or, or 41BB, and usually it has uh, a CD3Z domain as well. Those are CAR T cells. Uh, another main uh, type of uh, T cell uh, gene T cell therapy is a TCR based, a T cell receptor based um, um, T cell uh, for uh, cancer treatment. Basically, we induce the expression of alpha and a beta chain of the TCR, um, which um, as, 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 um, um, as you may know, uh, it's, uh, it binds to the, in the MHC context, uh, a peptide derived from uh, you know, antigens that you, uh, we should target. The, the main advantage of a TCR is that um, uh, intracellular proteins are are chopped down and presented to this, so we can potentially target um, um, either surface or intracellular antigens that are processed through the MHC. Um, in, a, in a CAR context, uh, the, the protein needs to be expressed on the surface of cancer cells. So um, 
that would be the main difference. Um, there are some other differences. Um, I'm just quickly going to comment of what is important here. As I mentioned, the T cell receptor, TCR, T cell, the MHC dependent. Um, uh, MHC meaning the major histocompatibility uh, complex. The card is independent. So as far as you have a protein on the surface of uh, tumor cells, you can, can target them. Uh, the TCR has a lower affinity uh, in terms of, uh, and this is the KD numbers, um, the range, then the car, um, th that could be good as well. Um, and, and, um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, intracellular uh, targets are possible, um, which uh, increase the number of possible targeted proteins um, in comparison to CAR. Um, and um, usually you have a lower risk of side effects in comparison to CAR, CAR um, due to the affinity of the, 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 the moiety and also because of on target of tumor effects. Um, it's difficult to find a clean target, meaning a protein that is expressed only in tumor cells and not expressing normal tissue, that's kind of tough. And that's the, actually uh, one of the main barriers in the, the whole field. Um, and um, so the main differences, uh, we um, uh, and, and my, my, my group and, and my collaborators, they, we work, um, we have a work focus on, on T-cell receptors. So we, um, we identify uh, a new, uh, for example, a new T-cell receptor for a T-cell that can recognize in a specific way uh, a tumor, human tumor. Uh, we clone the TCR, we identify the sequence, uh, we put into a vector, um, uh, different, uh, we, can, we can choose the vector that you want, I'm going to talk briefly later. And by uh, allowing the generation of these vectors, we can then um, get um, um, PBMCs or T cells for another patient, um, transduce them with this uh, vector and then create an army of uh, T cells now expressing the, the new T cell receptor um, and that can be injected back to our patients. So the aspects that I want to talk here, um, the scientific ones, um, as I mentioned, the TCR versus CAR uh, concept, uh, the T cell phenotype is very important uh, to consider. Um, the quality, actually quality of T cells that we have uh, and, and you infuse, is, 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 it dictates the, the response and persistency in, in patients. So uh, lots of discussions are between um, more effector uh, phenotype or memory T cell phenotype, um, even um, a memory stem cell phenotype, which, which are uh, types of T cells that differentiation stages that may favor uh, persistency of, of these T cells. Uh, CD8 T cells versus CD4 or both. Um, and there is this um, knowledge in the field that uh, maybe less differentiated T cells would be better in terms of engraftment and persistency and you know, automated response. Different target antigens is something that we need to really uh, pay attention to. And uh, it, it actually dictates the whole clinical trial. Um, as you can see here, there's a, a huge list of different uh, proteins that we can target. Ideally, we want, uh, want a protein that is expressed in tumors and not in normal tissue. Uh, tough, tough, dif uh, difficult to find that. Uh, but um, regardless, uh, there are so many targets that um, many groups are working on. Um, some of them with very uh, 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 good uh, safety profile. Um, I'm going to talk about um, NYSO1. NYSO1 being a cancer tested antigen that we chose uh, because have a very safe, uh, safety, a good safety profile is expressed only in certain tumor cells um, in, in, in a good um, uh, percentage. Um, and uh, it's not expressed in, in adult uh, normal tissue except, except, except for uh, normal testes. So it's, it's, a quite, uh, it's a relatively uh, safe, uh, let's say, nice uh, target um, to work with. So I'm going to show here that uh, the T cells are marked in green here because uh, we can uh, with a GFP uh, vector. In red are the melanoma, melanoma cells expressing uh, NYSO1. 
as you can see in this video labs microscopy, um, you can see that the, the T cells, the, the green ones, they attack the tumor cells very quickly. They, um, they, uh, they jump from one tumor cell to another and induce this uh, rounding of these uh, melanoma cells and inducing uh, apoptosis and, and you know, cell cytolytic effect. And it's quite fast. Um, uh, in the first two hours, you already have uh, about 90% uh, melanoma cells uh, destroyed in, in these cells. Another aspect uh, that we uh, also consider when you want to, um, you know, um, increase innovation of your platform. Um, uh, of course, we are we are uh, academic focused uh, in our uh, cancer center, so we we really want to innovate. And you know, uh, besides doing uh, a CAR or a TCRT cell, we want to combine with different modalities that can enhance uh, our treatment. And this is just a, a list of um, uh, current uh, uh, approaches um, going from chemo, radio sensitizers, small molecules, uh, combination with uh, checkpoint blockade, um, uh, anti-PD-1, PD-L1, or anti-CTF4, et cetera. Oncolytic virus, we have, we have, um, uh, wor have worked with vaccine virus to boost the immune responses, uh, utilizing different cytokines, chemokines, epigenetic modulators, um, um, even cancer vaccines in association with T cells, it really helps, uh, they have a synergistic effect in, in inducing better anti-tumor response. And, 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 and many strategies to counter the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And I'm going to mention our experience with TJ beta. TJ beta, as, 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 you, as you may know, uh, is highly expressed in, in the tumor microenvironment. Um, even tumor cells, and most of them express uh, TJ beta. Um, and uh, TJ beta is very uh, suppressive to T cells, um, inducing apoptosis, inducing cell cycle arrest. So if you block TJ beta in T cells, specifically in T cells, that would be a nice strategy. And we had data to, to show that. Uh, we constructed a, a dominant negative TJ beta receptor key basically a truncated receptor um, that doesn't signal. Um, it, it, act, it acts as a decoy uh, receptor. Um, I have some um, uh, assays to show that the, there is no phosphorylation of which is a marker for TG beta signaling. And um, in, in all uh, in vivo experiments with mice, uh, we utilize T cells that express a T cell receptor against GP100 uh, antigen. As you can see here, this, this, um, I'm going to summarize. Um, when you add this element of, of dominant negative TJ beta receptor uh, to block TJ beta affecting T cells, let's say 10 to the 500,000 uh, cells were uh, more efficient than 1 million of, of the TCRT cells that don't express the, the truncated receptor. So, really, um, encouraging, uh, interesting uh, in vivo data that we obtain. Uh, and one uh, discussion that we need to, to put here is that uh, all the cell uh, therapies uh, so far are all autologous. We get uh, cells from patients, the same patient uh, um, is injected with uh, the engineered T cells. But um, a lot of effort is being put into making a, a, uni a universal T cell that could be um, uh, off the shelf uh, T cell therapy. Um, there are new technologies uh, based on CRISPR Cas9 uh, platforms that can um, knock out uh, MATs, can knock out the endogenous um, alpha and beta chains uh, of the TCR, making possible. Uh, maybe in the future, um, uh, utilization of off-the-shelf uh, T cells. In terms of um, technical aspects, um, doc, um, um, Ken and Dr. Corneda um, also mentioned the different flavors of viral vectors. Um, in the T cell engineer field, we, uh, in terms of viral vectors, we, we have mostly lentiviral or gamma vector viral based um, approaches. And as a non-viral, very promising is the, the sleeping beauty transposon system. Um, and as, as you can imagine, it doesn't require uh, viral vector production, which 
um, and, and can be accomplished utilizing um, nucleic acid um, uh, electroporation. Um, in terms of other aspects that I would like to highlight, uh, open versus closed system. Um, the traditionally, we utilize uh, flasks um, uh, that are uh, grown in, inside um, inside incubators, and of course, we manipulate everything inside the biosafety cabinet. Um, nowadays, we have also closed systems. Uh, many companies are working very intensively on this, um, and many examples of bioreactors that seem to be very, very promising, uh, even uh, automated systems. Um, of course, uh, the upfront cost of acquiring those, those bioreactors is, is something that we, we need to take in consideration. The expansion time of this, uh, these T cells is um, um, traditionally uh, the, the CD19 CAR T cells, for example, they, uh, they require um, a prolonged uh, many days to even um, uh, one week, two week uh, expansion uh, to get enough numbers. Uh, and um, you get at the end uh, more effective cells, but maybe more exhausted cells, uh, possibly. Um, so the, the, the idea of uh, using a short uh, uh, cultivation protocol um, to get less differentiated T cells is something uh, also very uh, appealing. In terms of culture conditions, uh, media conditions, um, if you activate the T cells or not, or you add different flavor, different types of, um, of uh, cytokines into the culture. Um, that, uh, for example, IL-7, IL-15, and even IL-21 IL has been used. They have been used for, um, uh, it seems that they, uh, they produce a better profile of uh, immunophenotype of uh, T cells that can ingress better. Um, activation of T cells um, uh, for gamma retroviral transduction. Uh, obviously, we need to activate the, the, the cells for um, to make uh, the transduction efficient, efficient, uh, even for lentiviral vectors. So uh, there. Uh, in our experience, um, uh, our first clinical trial we based on the very traditional way to do things. We we started with a local forensis, um, get the white uh, blood cells. And we utilize the plastic in um, you know, the flasks, um, um, activate the, the, the PBMCs with anti-CD3. Um, we, we, uh, we use uh, interleukin-2 as well. We do two rounds of transduction with uh, our retrovirus. In this case, I know it's a one. It's a receptor retrovirus. Uh, a limited expansion, uh, very, very, a couple of days. And with our uh, rapid uh, expansion, um, uh, uh, short term expansion, uh, even at day six, after if you consider day zero, the, the time that we simulated, at day six, we can, we, we, we can get the final product uh, for immediate infusion of patients, or we can uh, freeze. Um, uh, it depends on the protocol we are working on. Um, uh, here are some of the, the testings that we do uh, in process in process testing uh, for uh, release. Um, showing our uh, Dr. Chodon is our uh, director of the cell production at our institution. She um, she she optimized the protocols. In terms of um, another technical aspect, that I would like to mention very important is uh, of course we need, we need space. We need a, a location to make all this happen. And in terms of modalities, um, we work with bricks and mortar. We have an actual facility, a GMP facility, clean rooms there. But different options that could be, um, you know, more economical, um, bio bubbles and, and pods, um, uh, clean rooms that can be set up in um, without major constructions and, you know, um, working ducts for, for um, um, uh, ventilation. That could be an uh, interesting um, uh, option. And uh, more recently, uh, possibly uh, a point of care um, uh, set up um, that could be um, in terms of generating the, the transduced uh, uh, cells um, or um, the, 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 the ingenuity cells at the site of um, near, in close to the hospital or cancer center. Um, of course, there are some regulatory hurdles that we, we, we should um, overcome, but uh, it's something that is also um, being discussed and uh, 
uh, could be very promising. So our facilities, so I'm going to uh, just mention quickly our, uh, we have two rooms, uh, two clean rooms in our facility um, uh, to support uh, uh, very early phase clinical trials, phase one slash two A clinical trials, small clinical trials. Um, um, and, and the design is, is basically um, it's the schematics here. We have another facility uh, recently um, constructed with four more rooms for self-production. So we have a total of six rooms, uh, six screen rooms, uh, class 10,000, ISO 7. And uh, we've uh, gone in, gone in and, and, and gone out uh, with differential pressure um, and monitoring. In terms of uh, uh, the medical aspects, I, I put under uh, technical, but uh, very important. Um, we uh, we need to come up uh, very early uh, in the process with a clinical protocol, um, um, write a clinical protocol. And the, the main items that I would uh, highlight here are uh, the, the, the choice of a lymphoid depletion regimen. We, we need to do some chemo or some other modality to decrease the number of T cells and lymphocytes to create space, if you will, space for the new uh, T cells to come in and, and graft. Um, the question of adding uh, interleukin Q, uh, for example, to our patients, uh, cytokine support, we, we can inject or not, um, and, and even high or low dose, uh, something that we need to consider to expand further the, the, the T cells. Also patient population inclusion, exclusion criteria, and for phase one trials, especially, um, those limiting um, toxicity criteria um, um, in the clinical protocol. And uh, informed consent form, investigator brochure is also important too. In terms of regulatory, um, uh, of course, it depends on the place that they're working on in the United States. Um, and, um, and specifically in our institution, we have local uh, board of uh, regulatory boards. SRCs, RIB, IBCs, by safety. On the more uh, um, countrywide uh, federal, um, we have FDA, as you as you know, um, and um, uh, basically uh, is where we apply for our investigational uh, new drug, uh, IND. Uh, it's called IND application. The FDA is very 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 helpful. They really um, try to stimulate um, um, new treatments uh, to help patients. And uh, it's very important to do meetings, uh, talk to them, um, discuss with them, uh, get some guidance uh, in pre-IND meetings and even in pre-IND meetings. And then the actual IND protocol, uh, IND package uh, includes all of these um, different um, items. The protocol itself, uh, the CMC section where we, we, you're going to add information about your cell product and the vector product from talks where you summarize all the data that you obtain from uh, the preclinical data, uh, mouse, um, um, non-human non primate uh, data, et cetera. Um, a section uh, about the previous human experience, if that applies. And um, of course, uh, responses to the pre-IND FDA comments that um, um, uh, needs to be addressed as well. And uh, this, the last hurdle, or, or let's say um, opportunity, if, if you are on more on the optimistic side, uh, we need to be optimistic uh, to, to start all of this. Um, it's, um, it's a financial um, uh, aspect. Uh, of course, the cost is, um, is, is not a, a cheap, uh, it's not a um, cheap type of uh, treatment, it's expensive. Um, we need um, there, there are many uh, aspects uh, on this the the, the patient uh, care costs um, um, and also even the the chemotherapy regimen and uh, interleukin two uh, even leukophoresis uh, and besides the if you want to use a vector um, the, the production of a lot of uh, uh, that that can be useful for patients right this is also increase the cost of the, the treatment. Uh, it's important to have this institutional support. The, um, um, the university or the hospital or the cancer center needs to be on the same page in terms of, um, and we are being very lucky to have that uh, outstanding institutional support. 
to help even in making our uh, to construct our facility there. Um, funding for grants, foundation philanthropic, and uh, I will just briefly mention the commercial. There are many ways to uh, also make this win-win um, uh, situation for all of us. Um, of course, if you have IP, you can license, but then you, you lose maybe control of the, the product if you license to, to your company. But uh, within the scope of a contract research agreements, um, depends on the, how you negotiate that. Um, um, there is, there is um, a space for financial um, funding and support. And of course, I mean, you, you, you can also um, make a spin off from our institution and, you know, and put your entrepreneurship hat and move forward. So uh, we successfully opened a clinical trial. Here is the schematic of our phase one clinical trial utilizing NYSO1 PCR, the predominant active beta receptor. Um, and um, it, it took three years. So it's not, you know, um, from, from no vector production facility, we start constructing. And um, uh, actually our R&D was approved in April, 2017. And um, uh, we could uh, start injecting patients um, uh, in 2017 after three years, starting from um, from scratch. And it's a, it's a fully integrated approach, right? We, as, as the, um, Dr. Cunha mentioned, it's a teamwork. We need uh, so many people to help us in this uh, enterprise. Uh, not only research labs, uh, we need the vector production. Uh, we need them, um, uh, well, if you want to use a non-vector production, that would be different. Um, a cell production facility, GMP facility uh, that we um, uh, established as well. The clinical team, very important. Uh, we have a very nice collaboration with our BMT program here uh, and our cancer center that they're very helpful. And um, I, I also recommend um, early interaction with uh, the BMT uh, folks. Uh, bone marrow transplant folks to help us in this. And obviously we get sample from patients, we do research and, and all those samples then can lead to, you know, new insights uh, in our research lab. So it's, uh, it's a nice uh, cycle of um, integration for translational medicine. And here are my acknowledgements and um, um, thank you very much all for, uh, um, for listening. And uh, I, I stopped there. Thank you very much. Koya, thank you very much. Uh, we are open for questions for the first two speakers. So um, you can put that into the chat uh, and we'll take a peek at those. Um, and maybe if it's okay, we, we've had some questions come in so far. So maybe we'll uh, go ahead and uh, maybe ask the first question and I'll leave that up to uh, either of you. The, the first question was, uh, why is CAR-T therapy so expensive? And uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but if, if the number of patients getting this therapy increased, will that make it more accessible? Uh, and I take that as being less expensive. Um, who could uh, answer? I would like to answer, Dr. Koya. Um, oh, can... sure. sure. Uh, for, um, it, it is a, it is expensive. I mean, the the the, um, the clinically approved, the FDA approved uh, standard of care uh, treatment. It's it's between three hundred to you know, four hundred thousand uh, dollars for the for um, therapy. Um, it's what they charge, right? But um, obviously, uh, at the academic uh, academic setting, we can we can do at cost. Um, if um, especially our, our institution is, is, is not for, for profit, we uh, we we can really minimize the, the cost. As I mentioned, the cost is uh, hospitalization. We we actually admit our patients um, at least for two weeks. Um, um, that's a cost. Um, um, chemo regimens, um, chemotherapy for lymphodepletion, uh, even leukophoresis to obtain the, the, the white cells. It is a cost that um, needs to be addressed. Uh, even we addressed by uh, our funding. 
uh, research funding. Um, and uh, the vector, right? The vector, the, the cell production facility, the, um, all the cost for to even maintain a vector production facility, it needs to be factored in to the final cost. Um, so very important institutional uh, support is important to help us and minimize the cost. But for sure, uh, the price, the final price can, can go down. And as I mentioned, um, uh, we are scientists, we are creative. We always try to find new ways to, to, um, to uh, introduce a genetic material, a genetic material to the cells. Uh, we can use viral, non-viral approaches. Um, could be much less uh, expensive uh, with, let's say, plasmid uh, electroporation or things like that. Um, and uh, also, um, 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 uh, depends on the country, I guess, um, the insurance can cover some of, of this aspect as well. Uh, thanks to you, Dr. Toya. We have a question for Dr. Cunha and it says, one, congratulations for your work. Excellent. Um, it's in, when do you believe the Brazilian population will have access to car uh, cell therapy and how many patients your program will be able to treat per year in Brazil and when? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you so much for the congrats. And uh, this is a team, a team job, in fact, is not only mine, but um, we're, we are expect to open the, the recruitment for a patient next year, I believe in the first trimester of the first three months of the next year, be able to recruit patients. Um, our GMP facility, we have two rooms uh, nowadays that can work with, uh, during the cell processing. So um, we believe you, you can treat uh, at least 15 patients uh, a year or a little, a little bit more. The point is not exactly the, the manufacturing processing room because with two rooms, you can do much more than that. But in fact, is the bedrooms for patients, the clinical units, it's quite small. So um, that will be our big challenge to have more beds to receive patients into the hospital to be treated. So is that why we're just, we're going to start with um, in our center, but as soon as possible, we wanna do a collaboration with other centers to give more options for other patients should be treated. Once you have a GMP facility manufacturing uh, units able to process much more cells than, than our clinical capacity to treat patients. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, there's a question for Dr. Koya. It said, you mentioned about Sleeping Beauty, um, uh, but you don't have a precise control about the copy number you deliver. Is it could it be a, po a problem for CAR-T therapy? Well, the, 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 there are many different ways to assess copy number. And um, um, at least um, um, the FDA guidelines, of course, is not you know, set in stone. But we propose a range of copy number, uh, <laughs> um, uh, not too much or not too low. Um, and FDA, if FDA, we, in discussion with the FDA, they, they agree with that, then uh, we, we go with that. There are many different ways. Um, uh, we utilize, for example, um, uh, uh, digital droplet uh, PCR to uh, quantify uh, absolute way the copy number will sell. Um, but um, but uh, the, the zipping beauty is, is a very uh, interesting approach, I think, um, this um, um, uh, very promising uh, future for, 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 for this technology. Um, and um, um, we want to hear more about that. I, I, don't, I don't utilize, uh, I mean, only in our research lab, a Sleeping Beauty, but um, um, our clinical trials are all based on, on gamma retrovirus and the antivirus for now. Um, I've got a question. Um, you know, the, Current, you know, applications that have been approved have been for hematologic malignancies, and I wonder, uh, you know, a lot folks have been working for a long time on solid tumors, and, and maybe one of you could just uh, talk a little bit about the differences of why there may be a little bit, at least earlier success around hematologic malignancies versus solid tumors for the audience. 
when you talk about that. Well, I, I, I give a, a step here. Okay. Yes, indeed. Um, um, I would say um, hematologic malignancy is a easier target, if you will. Um, especially CD19. CD19 was um, uh, is expressing uh, in you know the target tumor cells, but uh, B cells, um, um, uh, and not much in, in any other tissue in the body. Uh, and uh, people can live uh, can live without uh, B cells, right? Um, you know, get rid of them, destroy them, and but but the, the patient is there. Um, 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 so that, that's that's maybe a reason why um, uh, hematologic malignancy is uh, easier target. Polytumors, uh, you have to consider also um, first the, the antigen to be targeted is difficult to find good one, especially for cars. It's, when I say uh, a good target, meaning uh, it's not expressing normal tissue. Um, experience with some CAR T cell therapies um, uh, look to be quite toxic. Uh, for example, the um, uh, two car was was toxic. Um, in, you know, I'm experiencing it. have publications on that um, because it's expressing low level uh, in the lung tissue. So, uh, and and the tumor microenvironment uh, completely different um, in a in a solid tumor setting uh, makes things much much more difficult. We have a very immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, uh, soluble factors, cellular factor that uh, suppress the, the immune response. Um, that also is a, this big um, barrier in the field of um, treating solid tumors. But um, I, I, I would say that, that there are some, um, some very promising uh, treatments uh, based on TCR T cells and even CAR T cells uh, for solid tumor that um, may be approved very soon. Uh, we're going, we going to see that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would say almost the same. I think um, the the targets is the the first point. It's uh, we don't know uh, how good is um, the associated antigen tumors are to be a target for for cell therapy in general. So the you don't have a similar one to CD19 for or BCMA or CD22. So they are not uh, antigen tumors. So. Maybe that's why they are so effective. But in other way, as uh, Dr. Kwe mentioned, I think the microenvironment is very ho is very um, hostile to the T cells, and also the dysfunctional related to this process, the PD1 expression, the T3 T3 expression. So you can have cells much faster exhausted in, in tumor microenvironment than for leukemias and for lymphomas. So. That's why maybe the cell therapy for so the tumor should be combined with uh, with uh, checkpoint inhibitors, for instance. So this is another approach. Also, the the antigen for tumor cells are not homogeneous; they are very heterogeneous. In fact, so it's not the same for um, malignant hem hematology cells. And also, the gene modulation process is much more, let's say, clever or smarter for. For, for solid tumor than for leukemia cells, for instance. So there are many different um, aspects that should be um, uh, uh, overcome to, to that to have uh, surpass to be successful with solid tumors. The homing of T cells also, the delivery and distribution in the human body, also this is another important aspect. That's why some kind of constructs with TGF beta as you shown your clinical trial, this is very interesting processes because you're working with the target, but also you're trying to improve the T cell functional. So I think that's the way to, to be successful in that. All right, I've got one more question I think we'll ask before the break. We're about at the break time now. Um, there were some other questions that came up uh, and they were some of them more related to genetic diseases and hopefully we can get to those um, when we get to the next session where we're, we're just focusing on that. But the one question that I maybe just to put to you um, comes from an, a, a distinguished uh, uh, researcher in the field. This is, do you think uh, global initiatives for providing know-how and basic supplies could impact the final cost of CAR-T development and clinical use? Yeah, it's, um, I, I believe that to, um, you can you can move, uh, move down with the price and the cost of CAR-T cells and developing the the new technologies and uh, improving the cell processing aspects too, and uh, 
new vectors and new patterns. So I, I, I believe that um, locally, the countries and the institutes have to develop your new technology, your own technology. And uh, you need to offer more and provide more chance for patients to be treated. And that certainly you contribute for the cost and the access for this treatment. Sounds like that's also a charge for the Global Outreach Committee to, uh, to look yeah. into that too. So um, it's break time. I just want to let everybody know that we will be taking a 20 minute break now and we'll reconvene at, um, at 3.50 um, Brazilian time and 1.50 Eastern time in the US. Um, and so enjoy your break and want, want to thank uh, the both speakers for a wonderful uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank I'll you see so you much. in 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much.
Okay, now let's start the second panel. It is developing gene therapy clinical trials for monogenic disease. In this panel, we have three speakers. And the first one is Dr. Temis Maria Felix. She is a graduate in medicine from the Federal University of Health Science Foundation in Porto Alegre. She got PhD in the Universidade Federal de Rio Grande do Sul and she has experience in genetics with emphasis in human and medical genetics. Currently, she is working in the medical genetics service of Hospital de Clínicas de Porto Alegre. And the second speaker is uh, Dr. Margaret Cast Castro Ozello. She is a graduate in medicine and she got PhD title in, from the University of Campinas. And later she spent some time in the, David Lilly Krebs Laboratory at Queen's University in Kingston in Canada. Currently, she is <clears throat> director of the World Federation of Hemophilia Training Center and the University, University of Campinas. And the third speaker is uh, Dr. Puna Malik. Dr. Puna Malik is a pediatric hematologist oncologist in Cincinnati, Ohio. And she is affiliated with Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. She received her medical degree from Lady Hardinge Medical College and has been in practice for more than 20 years. Currently, she is working in the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. So now I invite the first speaker, Dr. Temis, who is going to speak about epidemiology of monogenic disorder in Brazil. Please, Dr. Temis. Thank you so much for the invitation to talk uh, on this webinar. I'm going to talk about epidemiology of rare disease in Brazil. This is a, a current uh, study that we are conducting here. So I'm going to show you how it's going to be. But first of all, I would like to start uh, with the introduction about rare disease. So rare disease is the term used to describe disorders that affect a few percentage of the population when compared to prevalent disorders in the general population. They are chronic, disabling, and usually affect the quality of life of individuals and their families. That's not a, there is no, uh, there is no universal uh, consensus about definition of rare disease. Uh, as you can see here in, on this table, uh, in the United States of America, for example, it's considered a rare disease when it affects less than 200,000 individuals. In Brazil, we use a different definition. We use the definition of WHO, which is, uh, it is considered a rare disease when it affects uh, 6.5 individuals in 10,000 inherit, inhabitants. So the, despite they are individually rare, collectively they affect 10% of the population. And we know there are many different rare disease, uh, something about 5,000 to 8,000 uh, disorders. And the majority of them are of genetic origin. So speaking about epidemiology of rare disease in Brazil is difficult because we don't have a national data of rare disease. We have such uh, some few examples uh, that I'm going to show you right now. One is the National Neonatal Screening Program, which is a program that started in 2001 that uh, screens uh, newborns for six different disorders, uh, phenylketonuria, congenital hypothyroidism, cystic fibrosis, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, butinidase deficiency, and sickle cell disease. As you can see here in this uh, paper that was published in 2007, uh, we can see the prevalence of some specific disorders like PKU is one in 25,000, 
congenital hypothyroidism, one in 2,400, uh, hemoglobinopathies, one in almost 2,000, and cystic fibrosis, one in 10,000, almost 11,000. So this is one way uh, that we have some data from Brazil. We have also uh, specific studies uh, perform, uh, done with a specific disorders that we can find in the literature. And I'm, I'm going to show you two very big tables, don't uh, be afraid of, but it is just to show that there are some uh, studies usually done not in the whole country, but usually in some states of Brazil where we can, we can see the prevalence of, for example, mucopolysaccharidosis in Bahia, in a specific site of Bahia, or uh, BH4 deficiency in Minas Gerais state, uh, Berardinelli syndrome in the north of Brazil, Huntington disease in the south of Brazil, and so on. So there is a need for uh, a, a national data for, uh, for rare disease in Brazil. So how is the rare disease uh, assist in our public health system? As you know, in Brazil, we do have a public health system. This system assists all Brazilians. Uh, and in January 2014, it was launched by the Ministry of Health, the Brazilian policy of comprehensive care for people with rare disease. This policy uh, uh, assists two main axes of rare disease, a rare disease of genetic origin and rare disease of non-genetic origin. And two types of service were, uh, were um, established. One is the rare disease reference service, those services, they assist more than one rare disorder and rare disease specialized care service does assist only one single disorder. So the, for reimbursement, the disorder are listed using ICD-10 uh, and also in this policy, uh, a lot of uh, genetic uh, tests, genetic di diagnosis test was added uh, uh, to the public health system. So we are now, we have reimbursement for this for many uh, different genetic tests that we didn't have before 2014. So nowadays we have 17 rare disease reference service in Brazil. As you can see, they are all listed here. Uh, they are usually in the capital, the main capital, main cities of Brazil. We don't have anyone in the north of Brazil or in the most part of the central area or northeast of Brazil, which is a problem because Brazil is a continental country and with only 17 service, it's not enough to assist all the rare disease patients. Not all, this, all, not all those uh, rare disease service, uh, reference service are working right now or are, they are actually, all of them are working, sorry, but they are not sending data yet to the Minister of Health. So I'm going to show you the results uh, of uh, what kind of uh, disorders are being seen on those uh, service. So this is a list of, the disorders there are uh, that were uh, seen by the nine rare disease uh, reference service. Uh, they are listed here. These this were from uh, more than twenty two thousand uh, procedures, and that that and this is important to say. Uh, one single subject can have more than one procedure. So this is not actually the, the number of subjects. So as you can see here, the majority of them are um, intellectual disability with no specific diagnosis. Uh, but we have here some monogenic disorder like osteogenesis imperfecta, neurofibromatosis, late onset cerebellar ataxia, congenital malformation syndromes, 
uh, muscular dystrophy, hereditary, spastic paraplegia, gangliosidosis, and so on. So using this data, we can have a, a, a clue of the epidemiology of those disorders in Brazil. But there is a problem with this data. Because as I mentioned before, the number of, they, they list the number of procedures and not the number of subjects. So as one subject can have at least uh, four procedures, do we can bias this data. Other type of bias is that some hospitals that are reference service, uh, rare disease reference service, are specialized in specific disorders. As I can tell you, my hospital, for example, which is uh, located in the south of Brazil, in Porto Alegre, we are also a reference service for osteogenesis imperfecta. So we have many uh, patients with osteogenesis imperfecta. And another problem is that uh, the way the, the diseases are coded are using ICD-10. And we know the ICD-10 uh, is not the perfect way to code rare disease because in a single ICD-10, we have sometimes uh, 10 or 12 or many other uh, rare disease listed there. So uh, the Ministry of Health doesn't use OMIN or Orfadata, and that, should, that could be the best way to do uh, this uh, coding. So because of that, uh, in this year, we start the Brazilian Rare Disease Network. This is a national survey of rare disease. It was funded by the Ministry of Health through CNPq, who is the major funding for research in Brazil. <coughs> Sorry. We have 40 institution, uh, institutions that are working in this project. They are all, you can see them all here in this map. Uh, we have all the 17 rare disease reference service that were already, uh, uh, they are already working. Uh, uh, the also 18 university hospitals and also five new native screen reference service. So the data collection will be in two ways. We are going to do a retrospective collection. We are going to review all cases that were attended or assisted in, this, uh, in these institutions from 2018 and 2019. Uh, it is good that we didn't uh, focus on 2020 because of the COVID-19 pandemic that all the, the the clinical, we have to stop uh, some uh, assistance of the patient sometimes. So we are going to do a retrospective study and also a prospective study next year. We are just starting the retrospective study and we are going to collect clinical data, consanguinity, diagnosis, all the methods for etiological diagnosis, time of diagnosis, age of the first symptoms, phenotype, according to the HPO terms, treatment, uh, if it is specific, dietitian or rehabilitation, previous internment, and also death, all those subjects. We are going to code the disease according to the name of the disease, orphan number, ICD-10, xenomine, and we are going to match all of them. So as you can see here, the institution will collect the data, and this data will be sent to a specific IT team that is based on at University of Sao Paulo at Ribeirão Preto under the coordination of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Domingos. And we are going also to study some specific disorders that I'm going to talk to you later on. So with this data, we are going to build an observatory, which is the Brazilian Rare Disease Atlas online. We, uh, this atlas is going to be according to WHO and the Minister of Health data source, which, and we will have the number and distribution of cases of rare disease, number of cases with and without a conclusive diagnosis, local of health assistance with a specific diagnosis. Also, the number of cases with specific therapy, like enzymatic replacement, dietitian, gene therapy, et cetera, and identification of clusters of rare disease of genetic origin in Brazil.
as I told you before, for some specific disorder, we are going to assess the journey of the patient uh, with rare disorder. It, this will be according to the value-based health management. And for these 13 disorders were chosen and they are listed here. I'm, doing, I'm not going to go all through them, but they, uh, these are disorders, they, they, they are disorders of genetic and non genetic disorders also. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, uh, we know uh, there is a necessity to have rare disease data in Brazil that we don't have yet. This is important for the policymakers for rare disorders in Brazil and also to guide therapeutic approach for those disorders. And I hope soon we will have data from the Brazilian Rare Disease Network that I could present to you later on. Unfortunately, we just started the project when Han invited me, Dr. Han invited me to talk, but we don't have any data yet to show you. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention and I'm available for questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Felix. <clears throat> Definitely, you're gonna have a very nice date pretty soon. And uh, now I invite Dr. Margaret Cast Castro Ozello. She's gonna talk about getting gene therapy for hemophilia in the clinical trials in Brazil, challenges and opportunities. Please, Dr. Ozello. Okay, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to, to thank for the opportunity to, to be here and for this honor invitation to be part of this uh, very important symposium. Uh, especially, I would like to thank Dr. Han. And the, uh, my task here was uh, actually to, uh, to share with you our experience in hemophilia clinical trials in Brazil. During this presentation, we will not uh, discuss any preclinical trials or translational research that we are involved. So most of the uh, uh, results that I will show, it is a result from the multi-center trials. So here are my disclosures and in bold are the three companies that we also uh, involved in some uh, hemophilia clinical trials. So just briefly, uh, when we talk about hemophilia, hemophilia is an X-linked bleeding disorder caused by a mutation in either the gene for factor eight for hemophilia A or factor nine for hemophilia B with an incidence of one in 5,000 and one to 30,000 uh, male birth respectively for hemophilia A and B. And 30% of this patient had no previous uh, relatives with hemophilia, what's quite important for a congenital disorders. Clinically, these patients present with uh, bleeding episodes that can be very frequent and could uh, be including spontaneous or due to some trauma and mostly of them occur into joints. And because of that, this is a disorder that became quite a disability disorder and it can uh, impact uh, negatively in the patient's uh, quality of life. And one important aspect in terms of the hemophilia is uh, uh, that we have a direct correlation between endogenous residual factor eight or nine levels and the disease phenotype. So the severe cases are the ones who has less than 1% of factor eight or nine. But if they uh, have a minor uh, expression uh, as one to 5%, they are classified as moderate and six to 40 the, are the mild case. And there is a huge difference in terms of the phenotype, even uh, when we compare a severe patient to a moderate case. And this is actually quite important issues when we discuss in terms of gene therapy, because mild expression can already improve the phenotype for these patients. And in terms of the treatment for hemophilia, this is based on uh, what we call replacement therapy. That's based on the infusion of either recombinant or plasma-derived coagulation factor eight or nine concentrates to prevent and to control the bleeding episodes. 
but there are some disadvantages related to that. Uh, first of all, these proteins have a short half-life. Uh, what uh, impairs that these patients need is to uh, receive uh, IV infusions uh, for three or even four times per week. And this uh, is start the evening early in their lives. And some of the patients will need uh, to use catheters. Also, if we don't have a very effective prophylaxis level, these patients uh, will be uh, easily uh, develop damage in their, into their joints. This treatment is, is very expensive, is a high cost treatment. And also, uh, although recently we have no replacement therapy and some of them very effective using sub-Q uh, infusions, uh, it's also important to say that uh, this is only for prophylaxis and these patients continues to be dependent on the treatment and it's not good for uh, when to control uh, a bleeding episodes that already happened. So the idea for gene therapy, if we compare here, uh, uh, consider each arrow one of IV infusion. Uh, what happened in the replacement, in the regular replacement therapy, is that the patient uh, needs to Re receive con uh, consecutively infusions to keep some levels of the factor uh, uh, activity in their circulations. And they have some peaks and some truffles. And this, of course, will not guarantee that this patient will not have any bleeding episode. But with the gene therapy, the concept is with a single infusion, we will, could be able to maintain a sustainable levels uh, of activity of factor eight or nine. And with that, we can protect this patient uh, from the bleeding episodes. Well, uh, the first gene therapy for hemophilia, the first generation clinical trials happened during the late 90s. And here in this table, we can see that we have different approaches at that time, including patients with hemophilia A and hemophilia B, uh, ex vivo and in vivo different uh, uh, strategies. And I would like to highlight here two protocols that they used the AV2 vector. Uh, one was uh, directed to uh, muscles and the other one directed to, to liver. And the, uh, in these two uh, protocols, we actually had three Brazilian uh, patients that participated into these studies. Uh, this study happened in collaboration to the Children's Hospital, Hospital of Philadelphia and the Averaging Pharmaceutical Company. And these patients were conducted here uh, at Unicam. And this was something that I would like to share with you, uh, our experience related to that. One thing that is important to mention, especially uh, related to the protocol that uh, used as a strategy AV2, uh, expressing factor nine uh, directed to the liver was uh, quite important in terms of the development of the gene therapy in this new generation of gene, uh, gene therapy trials that we are seeing now. Uh, some of you already are familiar with, with this graph that represents one of the patients that were, uh, was enrolled in, in this trial. He belongs to the high court dose with two times 10 to 12. And as we can see here in red, after two weeks of the infusion, this patient starts to express close to 12% uh, of factor IX activity. But after two weeks, the factor IX starts to decrease at the same time that he starts to show increased levels of uh, transaminides, uh, especially I IoT, as we can see here in, uh, in blue. And at the same time that the factor uh, nine uh, disappears, and as we can see, after a few weeks, the transaminides level uh, uh, were back to the normal level, but uh, this patient lost the previous factor nine expression. 
So only years later, it was possible to uh, explain what happened to this patient. That it, it is in interesting to say that this was not predicted uh, in the preclinical studies. So uh, in fact, what happened is uh, the transduced hepatocytes, uh, the liver cells that received the, the AV vector and of course received the transgene and starts to express the factor nine, also it starts to explain, express in their main brain proteins that belongs to the capsid of the, the, the AV vector. And at the same time, what happened uh, uh, is uh, particular with these patients is that he also developed a cellular immune response. So mediated by uh, uh, dendritic uh, present presenting cells that initiate a cellular immune response mediated by T cells. And what happens is these cells were able to recognize the uh, capsid protein from the factor. And when it happened, they also recognized the, this protein that was now expressing in the membrane of these hepatocytes. And because of that, uh, we had this uh, destruction of these uh, hepatocytes that were actually the ones that was expressing factor, uh, a, factor nine. So this is now more complex and we know uh, actually just uh, in the last two years, we have a very good symposium related to the AV immunogenicity. And this is one important issues related to the AV uh, gene therapy trials. And this uh, it was very remarkable in terms of this study that could help us to understand better uh, this issue. So when we uh, talk about uh, what we need uh, to in the requirements to, to actually promote uh, a, a gene therapy clinical trial, there are few issues that we needed to keep in mind. Well, for the institution, for, of course, we needed to uh, have adequate uh, structure for clinical trials, access to well-organized ethical and regulatory uh, board, we also need, in the perspectives of the clinical investigators and uh, staff, personal with experience in clinical trials, and they needed to be able to promptly evaluate and manage uh, any adverse events that can happen. And for the patient's uh, participants, they uh, must fulfill all the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. And they also needed to accept uh, to follow a very demanding protocol with potential risk and possibility of no efficacy. So uh, what uh, we learned from, from uh, our experience uh, back in uh, 98 to 2000? Well, uh, according to, to what I can share to you is uh, at that time, CONEP, that is our National Commission on Ethics in Research was recently constituted and the protocols were evaluated in the, uh, our local RB. We participate in these two protocols that were phase one and two gene therapy for hemophilia B. And we uh, actually uh, uh, had four Brazilian hemophilia B patients that uh, were considered if, to participate in these trials. But in fact, only uh, just three patients received the treatment. They flew to Philadelphia, received the treatment there, and they went back to Unicamp where uh, after two weeks where we followed these patients for several months, actually years. Uh, and one of the patients actually, actually could not participate because we have issues in, uh, to get his US visa. Well, uh, in terms of the challenge at that time, we had several ones and uh, it was not easy to overcome all the issues, uh, even to start the protocol, but also during the follow-up period, uh, one example of that is that we need, of course, to, to uh, ship the samples 
to the central lab. And I'm not only talking about frozen plasma. We need to have different uh, biological uh, samples. And uh, we have several difficulties to, to do that. But despite of all these difficulties, I'm proud to say that in my uh, here, I was the only one working with one of the lab technician. And our patients were regularly evaluated without missing any data. And for some of the protocols are the only ones who achieve that. Uh, in terms of the opportunities, I will say that this uh, uh, help us to establish a strong collaboration that continues nowadays. Also uh, make the investigators to be more familiar with high standards clinical trials. And personally, uh, for me was uh, one of, uh, when I just start my, my, uh, my uh, career, uh, I was quite involved with gene therapy and this helped me to make a decision to continue my research focus in gene therapy for hemophilia. And that's one of the decisions that made me uh, for my postdoc during three years in Canada, only focus in hemophilia uh, gene therapy. And nowadays, well, we know that clinical trials uh, in Brazil uh, move uh, and improve quite a lot. Uh, so the process is well established and in terms of the poss possibility for gene therapy clinical trials, the ethical process is now well established. Uh, we have uh, well established IRBs and also CONEP, uh, as I already said, uh, and a platform since 2012 that we can submit all the, the documents and this makes fast the, this process. Also, it was already mentioned by Dr. Cunha and Dr. Ran about uh, the importance of our national agency, uh, the uh, regulatory agency, Visa, that has one of the office that is the blood tissue cells and organs, uh, who actually uh, is working quite uh, in improving uh, the, uh, in terms of the advanced therapies products. And here are two results resolutions that is already mentioned by Dr. Cunha, one from December 2012 that made the rules to conduct clinical trials uh, for advanced uh, uh, therapies, including cell and gene therapy. And uh, of course, when in terms of uh, the gene therapy, uh, we also needed to be involved with uh, aspects of biosafety. And uh, here in Brazil, we have CNT, uh, CTN Bio, that's our National Technical Commission on Biosafety that was created in 1995 and they actually established all the national's biosafety policies regarding uh, genetically modified organisms. Uh, and the, uh, it was very involved with agriculture, but all research institutions uh, that is involved with GMOs also needed to have this uh, internal biosafety commission. So as a result, uh, according to uh, my, my search uh, yesterday in Brazil, we have uh, at the clinicaltrials.gov uh, around 73 different gene therapy clinical trials, so of course, in different levels. And uh, some of them are my more to, to establish uh, different levels of, of uh, these trials, but at least six of them is related to hemophilia, as I can guarantee for you. And in terms of the hemophilia uh, uh, gene therapy clinical trials that we have nowadays, they are all using the same uh, approach. So is our AAV uh, based, uh, AAV vector based gene therapy directed to liver. Uh, so uh, AV is a non-integrating uh, virus vector, and we have here the, the transgene could be either the factor eight or factor nine, and uh, these patients receive 
IV infusions with this vector containing uh, the, the transgene. And this vector usually are uh, serotypes that had tropism to, for liver. And also the promoters are expressing in, in liver cells. And in hepatocytes, they are transduced and it starts to express the protein. Uh, well, there are some advantages uh, for this approach. Uh, one is uh, it helps to have just an in vivo administration. And in the case here is IV infusion that takes one hour to no more than two hours. It's very efficient in terms of gene transfer because several uh, genome copies per cell can be achieved. But there are some disadvantages. Uh, the capacity for the transgene in the AV vectors are quite limited, uh, 4.7 kb, and this is very uh, what we have in terms of the B domain deleted factor 9 uh, gene, what is not a problem for factor, uh, uh, factor 8 gene, but for factor 9 is, is not a problem because it's a, a small gene size. Is also because it's a no integrating uh, cells, uh, we will not uh, efficiently uh, trans, uh, tr uh, have transduced uh, cells that is under division because when the cells divide, we will uh, dilute this expression. Uh, and because of that, uh, most of the protocols uh, using this uh, aspect is more related to only uh, patients, adult patients. There are the immunogenicity involved, as I already said, the cellular cells, but also pre-existing Im immunity. Uh, and because of that, some of these patients, uh, we consider this treatment as a single treatment and potential hepat uh, hepatotoxicity. But we have a large experience now in clinical uh, trials involving hemophilia. And just to give you some examples, we already had six different protocols for hemophilia B. And nowadays we have three ongoing gene therapy clinical trials for hemophilia B. Uh, they are using a uh, 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 gain of uh, mutation for factor 9, factor 9 in Padua. Uh, and they, uh, we could achieve quite uh, close to the normal levels of factor IX expression. And here I just briefly want to show to you one of the studies that we have participated at the Spark Pfizer. Here's the results of this study uh, from the phase one and two. And one thing for the first year of these 10 patients, what we can see, and this is actually quite often in these hemophilia trials, that we have this uh, large variability uh, in terms of the expression. And there is no uh, exactly how we can determine which patient will have the highest or the lowest expression. But all these patients had a, a, a decrease in 95% in terms of the, the bleeding episodes, and they decreased 90 to 90% the consumption of factor 90 in the first year of the treatment. So for the hemophilia A, we have now five different clinical trials, all using the same approach. What is the difference here? We're using higher dose compared to hemophilia B protocols. And because of that, uh, it's also uh, more often that these uh, studies would require also immunosuppression, as we can see here. Uh, we have three protocols that we are participating here at Unica. One is from the Biomarine using AV5 and the dose of 6 times 10 to the 13. Uh, Spark is the, the other one using 2 times 10 to 12. And Sangamo 5 we use it 3 times 10 to 13. And only very briefly here is the phase one and two results of the Biomarine Hemophilia A uh, study. At the first year here in the dark blue are the ones who use this highest in the what considered therapeutic dose. And as we can see, we still have this variability in terms of the expression, but quite good expression. And this 
became uh, achieved uh, in the normal range of factor eight activity. But over the years, and now we have four years of the six patients, we can see that we decreased and we lost some of the expression. Although this patient uh, during these four years decreased in 95% of the bleeding episodes and the factor eight consumption. Uh, this study now is in the phase three, is already enrolled for more than uh, uh, one year, 135 hemophilia, uh, 34 hemophilia patients. And uh, in Brazil, we have the highest number of patients enrolled in this trial. So in summary, uh, we can say that based on this recently uh, clinical trials results, I have no doubt that hemophilia became a promising uh, and safe and probably cost-effective therapeutic alternative for the future. In Brazil, we are able to successfully uh, enroll patients in several trials for either hemophilia A and B. Some challenges, uh, well, uh, there are several, as I said, to accomplish this very, this very demanding protocol. Uh, also to keep the, the GCPs uh, to conduct clinical trials, and we needed to also be prepared to possible inspections of regulatory agents. But there are several opportunities, and some of them uh, is also to continue the collaboration and uh, also to uh, give the opportunities for these patients to uh, have a chance to receive novel therapeutic alternatives and maybe in the future became available for our patients. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all my group here from our hemophilia treatment center at Unica. Here is just the ones who are involved with different clinical trials. Also, Dr. Kat High, that at that time uh, it was uh, the PI from CHOP and the Professor Valder Arruda, uh, that is a Brazilian who moved to, uh, to CHOP and is still there in researching involving uh, gene therapy. And my professor, David Lidicrap at Queen's University in Kingston, where I also developed some of the studies in hemophilia gene therapy. Uh, Professor Glenn Pierce, that at the time uh, was from Avgen, and now he is the vice president of the World Federation of Hemophilia. All the companies that's now involved in this gene therapy clinical trials, and of course, all our hemophilia patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. It was really a nice talk. Thank you. And now I invite Dr. Puna Malik is going to talk about considerations for early clinical trials on gene transfer. Uh, hi, um, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, and I'm going to uh, present to you um, uh, a march that my lab took for developing genetic therapies for monogenic disorders with sickle cell disease as the model. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through our journey so that it gives you an idea of what it takes to translate a gene therapy trial to the clinic and uh, the resources necessary. So it's not advancing. I'm sorry, there's some which here. I might have to present it. Is this visible? That is this still visible to everybody? Uh, because if I go on full screen, I'm unable to advance for some reason. Yes, uh, we can see it. You can see it? Yeah. Sorry about that. I don't know if the advanced tool is not working. So, um, um, basically, I'll start with uh, sickle cell disease as the example. So sickle cell disease, as all of you are well aware, is a monogenic disorder, one of the most common monogenic dis disorders caused by a defect in the beta globin gene. So sickle RBCs have abnormal shape. Um, they increase the blood viscosity, they block blood vessels, and they have one-tenth, approximately one-tenth the lifespan of a normal red blood cell. 
And patients with sickle cell disease are at continual risk of vascular uh, occlusions, causing severe complications. And 35% of the patients are hospitalized uh, more than three times a year. And this is actually a target population that could use uh, corrective therapies. So um, this, uh, these are just examples of the uh, life-threatening complications and the organ damage that occurs in sickle cell disease. Children get dactylitis. Um, one of the fatal complications, uh, potentially fatal complications, acute chest syndrome, splenic sequestration, stroke, avascular necrosis, um, hepatic extramedullary hematopoiesis, gallstones, um, and um, as I said, the patients with severe um, phenotypes are really um, good candidates for corrective therapies like bone marrow transplant or gene therapy. And the pros of gene therapy for sickle cell disease, which is now in clinical trials, is each, each patient is their own donor. And bone marrow transplant has that limitation where only about 15 to 20% of patients have a matched sibling donor. Then no immunological side effects. And it's a one-time permanent correction. And uh, hopefully I can convince you that you can do it with reduced intensity conditioning. Uh, the thing to remember about sickle cell disease is that the global burden is enormous. There's about 15 to 20 million people with sickle cell disease worldwide. Uh, we just heard that it's also very prevalent in Brazil, although we still classify as a rare disease. Uh, but definitely in the US and Europe, it is a rare disease. Only 0.2 million patients reside in USA and Europe, while the rest in uh, Africa, uh, India, and uh, hence genetic therapies need to be feasible outside the USA and Europe. And this is a slide I borrowed from David Williams, where it shows the concept of gene therapy. So unlike AAV, very elegantly presented by the previous speaker, uh, this gene therapy is done ex vivo. So you remove hematopoietic stem cells, you have a disabled uh, vector or disabled virus that carries your gene of interest. You put it into the stem cells ex vivo, and then you transplant the stem cells back as an autologous transplant. So this is uh, not, this was an animated slide, but um, so basically, it takes a village to do a gene therapy trial. So there's a lot of requirements, expertise, infrastructure, expenses, institutional commitment, translational capabilities, coordinated effort with clinical and regulatory support systems. And so um, when we embarked on this trial, we ident I ident identified the target and developed and optimized the vector. Uh, here it was a lentiviral vector and ensured that it was produced in high enough titers or its potency is high. Uh, we characterize animal models of sickle cell disease, developed a model of human disease, and then developed and optimized gene transfer techniques in hematopoietic stem cells, showed correction in animal and human models. And once this was basic research was the proof of concept that we can indeed correct um, the disease with the gene therapy vector we have, we embarked on translation. So we did formal efficacy studies to show stable long-term correction, safety studies, uh, pre did the preclinical development and scale up for GMP manufacturing um, and preclinical development scale up of gene transfer into human HSC and submitted uh, for regulatory approvals to IRB, IABC, uh, RAC, which was very active at the time we were applying for the gene therapy trial, the FDA. And in the FDA in the US, we went through a pre-pre-IND where we just submit an informal request um, and non-binding advice from the FDA. And then we submitted a pre-IND and IND. So this was a long march um, and things that you can't see here is that it took like almost a decade from the time we published the basic research to the time we enrolled the first patient. 
Uh, we performed actually at our own institution, CGMP vector production, uh, the stem cell collection, um, the gene transfer in our GMP facility. And we developed our own protocol um, and performed, a, started a phase one, two study. And in 2018, a year after we had done the first two patients, uh, this was uh, licensed to Erewhon Sciences. So now Erewhon Sciences has the rights to, is conducting the trial in this disease. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that I give uh, credit to all the other groups that are also doing gene therapy for sickle cell disease. Uh, so the current gene therapy approaches is activation. I'm only talking about the lentiviral-based approaches. CRISPR Therapeutics has embarked on a gene editing trial, which is very similar to the first uh, bullet listed here, activation of a gamma globin gene by knockdown of its repressor BCL11A um, that allows postnatal expression of HBF or fetal hemoglobin in adult RBC. Uh, and they're using this uh, therapy with following myeloablative busulfur. This trial is being conducted by Boston Children's and also uh, funded by Bluebird Bio. Um, CRISPR Therapeutics is using gene editing to knock out the erythroid enhancer of BCL11A. So it's in, in, in uh, Boston, they're using an shRNA in a lentivirus vector that destroys BCL11A, but the concept is the same. Um, in red here is what we I started in the lab and now it's being run by R1 Sciences. And with full disclosure, I want to ensure that you know that um, you know I have uh, I have been the inventor where the when the technology was licensed, and I'm a consultant with R1 Sciences. So here it's insertion of a modified gamma globin gene. Uh, and the, I will show you what modification we made so that it has a higher anti-sickling potential than endogenous fetal hemoglobin. And this trial is being done with a reduced intensity melphalan. And then uh, we, there are trials, two trials of modified beta globin genes uh, with anti-cycling properties, beta T87Q, beta AS3, being uh, done by UCLA Bluebird Bio and UCLA, which is now, I think, licensing it to Orchard Therapeutics. Just to note that for all these vectors, the anti-cycling globin is driven by the beta globin promoter and locus control regions so that the gene is expressed only in erythroid cells and it stays on in adult RBCs despite being a fetal gene. So um, the modification we developed for our vector uh, was uh, such, we made a mutation at the 16th amino acid, changing a glycine to aspartic acid. So it's G16D. And this G16D is easily distinguished from endogenous fetal hemoglobin because of a charge change, it, uh, it runs differently on HPLC. It has a higher affinity for alpha, which is pictorially depicted here. So if you had equal amounts of beta sickle and G16D, this would more avidly bind alpha to form the tetramer and outcompete beta sickle. And therefore, when we put it for the same vector copy number, we form, we make much more G60, HBF G16D than HBF per vector copy number in two animal models of sickle cell disease. All our preclinical work was actually done with the uh, uh, the gamma globin vector. Um, and then uh, we, uh, uh, the clinical trial actually proceeded with the modified gamma globin vector. Uh, so this is just to very quickly run you through the preclinical uh, stuff we had to show to the FBA. We had to show that it expresses, it's a potent vector, has high HPF expression. It prevents sickling. It is stable. So we have, say, these, each symbol is a different mouse. And you can see that throughout for six months uh, of primary transplant and through secondary transplant, we have stable... Uh, fetal hemoglobin expression and at a therapeutic level. And when we do the half-life of sickle red blood cells, 
we see approximately a five uh, fold increase in the half life. Uh, we then, uh, that was, uh, we then tried reduced intensity conditioning. In the previous one, we had myeloablative conditioning model. So in order to make this easy to perform, especially in resource poor countries, we wanted to try reduced intensity conditioning. And here we found that uh, we varied the stem cell dose and, uh, and we wanted to, and gave reduced intensity irradiation. And we found that in mice, if the hemoglobin F percentage was greater than 10%, we were able to achieve long-term um, correction of sickle cell disease, including correction of the organ damage. Uh, and then we went to a monkey. Uh, we, we tried these. Of course, we don't have a monkey with sickle cell disease. This was a normal monkey. But just to show that we are able to express the transgene and we have stable expression, and the expression is this monkey was followed up to approximately three years. And you can see a stable vector copy number present in all lineages. So it, we did transduce, it was a stable multi-lineage graft. Uh, we had to show that uh, we were able to get fetal hemoglobin expression in uh, human cells, human sickle cells in vitro. Uh, and this was the human model we had developed. And then finally, we went through development where we produced GMP grade vector, we uh, optimized plerexifor mobilization and apheresis of CD34 positive stem cells in patients. As you know, GCSF cannot be given to sickle cell disease patients, and therefore we had to use an alternative method. Uh, and then we optimized the transduction or gene transfer into stem cells and then optimize the reduced intensity condition. Um, I'm just going to show you patient, data from patient one. The rest is being presented in the next couple of days at ASH. Uh, so I don't want to steal the thunder um, of uh, Dr. Grimley's presentation. He will be presenting data on the first three patients that have uh, long, long enough follow-up now. Uh, but basically the maroon portion of the bars here, the darkest ones is HBFG16D. And then the lighter portion is endogenous HBF in these patients. And then we have hemoglobin A2, which is also a very potent anti-sickling globin. Uh, so overall, this patient has about 30% anti-sickling globin expression and about 20% HBFG16D expression uh, and this patient is now three years out uh, of, and the, all of these patients just, again, I'm not going to give the clinical details here because it's being presented in a, at ASH um, as an oral presentation. So uh, basically uh, we show that this HBFG16D carrying vector has long-term engraftment uh, with reduced intensity melphalan. This causes only about a week to 10 days of cytopenias. And four subjects have been dosed uh, so far. The fifth one is anticipated in February, 2021. Uh, no subjects had experienced any safety events related to uh, this gene transfer. And the latest safety and efficacy data, as I said, will be presented. Um, and uh, the, all three patients have greater than uh, 85 to 90% improvement in their uh, sickle cell phenotype. Patient three has had absolutely uh, no sickle cell disease symptoms. And with that, I will uh, switch to what are the requirements? What was important for uh, developing this gene therapy? So here are important considerations. The vector you make, whether it's a gene editing tool or a lentiviral vector has to be high quality, high titer or high potency. And the expression from that vector is also very important, especially if it's a lentiviral vector, you need a high level of beta or gamma globin expression. Uh, Adequate HSC collection is another important factor um, for success of gene therapy. Um, 
efficient gene transfer uh, to target a vector copy number of one to three or efficient editing if it's a gene editing vector. Uh, HSC maintenance is very important and I cannot emphasize this enough. If it, HSCs very readily change fate to progenitors if they are not handled properly. And, and this is very important to maintain, otherwise it's a short-term graft and failure of gene therapy. Conditioning, so reduced intensity conditioning has been used for immunodeficiency disorders, but myeloablative chemotherapy is the norm for all non-immune deficiency gene therapies, including hemoglobinopathies. Reduced intensity conditioning is being utilized by Erwan Sciences for hemoglobinopathies, especially sickle cell disease. And currently, there are several non-chemotherapy or antibody-based approaches that are in the works. So hopefully, these approaches will come forward because I certainly feel that these will be uh, the ones that will make uh, corrective therapies very widely available. Patient selection and preparation is also a very important factor in uh, success of gene therapy. So for instance, Bluebird Bio showed non-beta-0 thalassemia patients. Initially, they had in low dose. They were successful at correcting non-beta-0 thalassemia. That means they have beta-plus thalassemia or beta-E thalassemia uh, because they don't require, their tank is not so empty, so you can fill it easily. Uh, but beta-0, beta-0 thalassemia was more difficult uh, to fix completely or correct completely. Uh, similarly, absence of stroke in sickle cell disease patients until you have proven that this therapy cr creates a very stable transgene expression high level, you don't know whether uh, uh, withdrawal of transfusions will cause a secondary stroke in a prior stroke patient. So that's important in eligibility. Uh, a healthy bone marrow microenvironment is also important because uh, patients need to be transfused to um, uh, improve their bone marrow microenvironment. Otherwise, they don't engraft well. There's a very inflamed bone marrow microenvironment with very altered microvasculature. Monitoring of safety is very important. Insertional um, oncogenesis has not been a problem with lentiviral vectors thus far but it's important to monitor. Conditioning associated MDS and leukemia has now been reported with one patient treated with a lentiviral vector with sickle cell disease. And this is also important to monitor. And then it is too early to assess the off-target editing effects of gene editing trials, but these will need to be monitored as the clinical trial experience and the science evolves. And finally, I think resources to consider for developing gene therapy for a monogenic disease in Brazil. The first thing, if it's an academic trial, is a strong institutional commitment. Uh, you require funding if you're doing it on your own and not a company-sponsored trial. Experts in the specific monogenic disease that is being targeted are very essential. Um, GMP grade vector, either being made available from a company or have the manufacturing capability to make it. Stem cell collection, have, have a good apheresis unit that can collect stem cells. A GMP cell manufacturing facility for stem cell isolation and gene transfer. Uh, these days, Milteni sells a closed processing system called the Prodigy uh, that is being used for CAR T cell manufacture, can also be used and adapted for stem cell gene transfer, stem cell isolation and gene transfer. For hemoglobinopathies and maybe even other diseases, you need good transfusion support through the transplant, a good transplant facility and expertise, safety monitoring, including integration site analysis or off-target effects. And there are, we don't do it ourselves, there are groups who are expert at this, who are willing to collaborate and do this as a fee for service. Uh, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania does our integration site analysis on our patients. Long-term monitoring capabilities for late effects and ongoing assessment for organ damage, disease phenotype, uh, type, uh, leukemias, whatever needs to be there and a strong communication and collaboration with the patient's primary physician or specialist. 
um, and the cell and gene therapist. This collaboration is very essential. And with that, I will stop and take any questions. Dr. Malik, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for some great talks. Um, I think we're going to open it up to questions. Again, please, if you've got some questions, uh, please add it to the, the Q&A. Um, but I think I'll start with a question uh, for Dr. Felix. Uh, one of the questions was, um, you know, Brazil is a very large country over a large area. Are there specific regions which seem to have a higher rate of mutations or, or uh, genetic diseases? Um, if so, is there any reason uh, why that, uh, uh, that might be? Um, I forgot to turn on my, my mic. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there are some areas in Brazil where we have a right, uh, high rate of consanguinity or are very isolated areas with a high rate of endogamy. So in these areas where uh, we have some special, like because of the founder effect, we have a, a high uh, rate of specific disorders. One example uh, is we know that in the, in the countryside of Goiás, which is state here, we have a high rate of xeroderma pigmentoso. Uh, we have a high rate of mucopolysaccharidosis, a special type in the countryside of Bahia, uh, in, at Monte Santo. So uh, there are specific, the, and pycnodistosis also in some areas. Uh, this is because of those high rate of consanguinity and endogamy. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the, I have a question now for Dr. Azello. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about trying to maneuver the challenges of um, one, hemophilia A uh, gene therapy uh, versus B, and maybe make a little comments of, of some significant difference they've had there with developing vectors. And then there are some newer agents too that are coming online for hemophilia and trying to help to decide, you know, are there specific patients you think are really more appropriate for gene therapy versus some of the newer alternative therapies? Okay, thank you for the excellent question. Uh, well, uh, is, in fact, we have now several different new uh, uh, options for the treatment of patients with hemophilia A and B, even sub-Q and monoclonal antibodies and other very effective products. And, uh, but I still believe that uh, there is a room, especially in developing countries in Brazil, South Africa, countries that where gene therapy will fit for some of our patients. And I still believe that uh, there is a possibility. The results are very promising. And uh, this is a very expensive treatment and different than other rare disorders where we don't have options. And we feel we have options for treatment and that's true. But uh, I think for some patients, they will benefit from uh, gene therapy. And in terms of the difference of uh, gene therapy for hemophilia A and B, there are several. And uh, one is the size of, of the, uh, the gene for, for factor nine, that is smaller than, very, uh, than when we compare to factor eight. Actually, in fact, the factor eight, usually we use this B domain deleted uh, transgene that is very uh, uh, active. We don't need the B domain, that's the large portion of the protein uh, that is not uh, activated during the coagulation process. Uh, the other thing is uh, factor uh, eight is more immunogenic than factor nine. So it's quite common what we call the development of inhibitor among the hemophilia A patients, especially the severe ones that develop 30% of them can develop this quite difficult uh, uh, complication 
and this is, was a concern uh, in terms of the gene therapy. In fact, the gene therapy now is only uh, enrolled patient that has no history of inhibitor, but I believe for the future, the idea of gene therapy can be uh, even uh, can simulate what we use as immune tolerance uh, induction, that is the treatment for hemophilia with uh, uh, inhibitor. So there are a few differences, but it's quite surprised that especially the first one was from Biomarine that had a very excellent expression, overexpression. What is the problem? We don't want that these patients became, you know, risk for thrombosis. Uh, but in the end, I think uh, in terms of the long-term uh, expression, the only thing that we are seeing is uh, the durability. So maybe for the gene therapy with using this approach, we are seeing the decrease of expression in some of the patients with uh, hemophilia A. And I'll just let you know that uh, one of the other questions that just came up was about, uh, do you think an integrative vector as a lenti vector is better <laughs> than AAV? Um, I can put in, you know, the mm -hmm. AAV because it can be delivered in vivo fairly safely, mm -hmm. I think is why it's gone forward to, to target the liver. Uh, giving lentiviral vectors intravenously has a number of other challenges too. So I think it's a really good question and, uh, and probably uh, folks will work on that uh, and, and maybe doing in vivo gene editing might be something else to, for folks to consider in the future. But uh, Thank you uh, for that. But it is, it, it is a very fascinating uh, and challenging uh, disease to treat. Uh, so um, I think maybe talking a little bit, I, there's also a question, maybe we'll give it to, to Dr. Malik uh, about gene editing uh, and, and that everybody, the question is today, everybody is trying to use gene editing technology, but, but off target is a very concerning issue. Um, when you do gene editing on bone marrow cells, can you sort of comment on the potential challenges there? Yes, uh, we actually ourselves in the laboratory have embarked on gene editing as well. So one of the things with gene editing is that currently what's going into the clinic is gene disruption. So CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology has really revolutionized gene editing. And the way it works is the Cas9 is a nuclease that causes a double strand break in a cell. And if no template is provided, the cell immediately sews up that break. It repairs that break, but it's a, it leaves a scar behind. So it's not a perfect repair. And so it puts the gene out of frame and causes a knockdown. And this approach is being used to disrupt the BCL11A enhancer. The ideal approach of gene editing would be to actually correct the mutation because in, in uh, sickle cell disease and maybe even thalassemia, increasing fetal hemoglobin can cure the disease, but this is not really an option. For example, hemophilia, you know, so you really need to correct the defect and cause what is called homologous recombination and provide a template that the cell can use to repair. And that technology is far less efficient. The other thing with gene editing is currently the, pro the only way to be able to deliver the gene editing machinery into stem cells is by electroporation or nucleoporation. And that uh, requires a lot of stem cells because there's a lot of uh, cell deaths associated with that. Uh, so those technologies are developing and being translated but I think the therapies that are going into the clinic are really gene disruption strategies, not gene correction strategies. Uh, uh, the pros and cons of lentivirus versus uh, gene editing, uh, I will just speak for sickle cell disease. The advantage of gene editing is it's a hit and run. So it, you will repair the gene or you will do the gene editing portion and then the Cas9 nuclease, which is delivered as a protein, and the guide RNA as an RNA is just has a limited life and it's destroyed in the cells. And therefore, um, you don't have anything left. You know, you basically repair or disrupt a gene and walk away. Uh, 
So the, when you deliver a lentiviral vector, it integrates randomly into the genome. So it can have a potential of landing at a wrong spot or cause insertion of oncogenesis. And that is something that uh, gene editing does not have. But then with gene editing, uh, the fidelity has to be perfect. Otherwise you could be editing in off target sites. You know, and if you create two double strand breaks, supposing you have, for instance, the globin genes are very similar. So if you're trying to cut in the globin locus, you may have some recognition of another globin gene. And when you create a two double strand breaks in a chromosome or anywhere in the cell, you have chances of translocations. So there are other um, off the off target effects have to really be teased out with gene editing. We don't know enough to be able to tell what will be the off-target effects. Only time will tell. As you know, that experimental models never predicted insertional oncogenesis before vectors went into clinical trials. It was only after we did the clinical trials, the XKIT trials, that we heard of insertional oncogenesis. So I think for gene editing, the same thing will evolve, that initially we'll see a huge success like we saw with XKID, with science and nature papers. And then we saw similar papers talking about insertional oncogenesis. So I think that that's how we learn and that's how we improve the field and the field evolves. So gene editing is at a stage where lentiviral gene therapy was about 10 years ago and uh, time will, as, as time evolves, we will hear about uh, what the side effects are. Thank you, Dr. Malik. Um, we have another question that I think actually for two of the speakers may want to uh, chime in on. Someone is asking about the estimated cost for a gene therapy product for hemophilia or sickle cell. And I guess they're, they're pretty different. Um, so maybe hemophilia and sickle cell compared to what the current cost of treatments would be. And I don't expect you guys to have numbers, but if you do, that's great. But maybe just talk about some of the issues here um, for this. Maybe uh, Dr. Malik, since you're, you're not muted right now, maybe just make a comment and we'll have, then have Dr. Ozello yeah. uh, comment about hemophilia. So I actually, you know, since we developed the trial academically, um, you know, and we've licensed it to Arowan Sciences that are, that are currently just bearing the expenses of the trial, I can't really put a number on because we try as an academic institution, as an academic investigator, we have a lot of things at our disposal that we don't even think about as costs. So, but I know that the Bluebird Bio, uh, uh, vector uh, gene therapy for thalassemia. It's been approved in Europe and it's about, I think about $2 million. So it is pretty expensive. The price tag is very high there. Um, I'm guessing that gene therapy, even if it's simplified, reduced intensity, and this is just a guess, it might be anywhere from a million to $2 million. So it is pretty expensive right now. And, you know, transplants were pretty expensive and initially started too. But as it rolls out and as the competition increases, more and more people are coming up with different approaches. I think the prices and the technology gets simplified. If we don't have to have people in a bone marrow transplant unit, if we can give outpatient, you know, minimal intensity, either chemo or an antibody based approach, that significantly, the major costs of gene therapy are actually the transplant portion. You know, a patient admitted for about two to three weeks in a transplant unit can become really, really expensive. Um, but uh, this is where we are right now with gene therapy. How about for hemophilia? Yeah, so for hemophilia, of course, is already a very expensive uh, treatment. Uh, and just to give an idea, in Brazil, we have around 13,000 hemophilia patients. And the program that also covers other uh, congenital bleeding disorders, we have the budget in Brazil that is around 1.3 billion reais, Brazilian reais, what is around the $350 uh, million per year. 
uh, and this is the budget that we had for several years. So uh, I have actually a, a approach for that. We don't have the final cost, but all this, the money that we are saving this program, we enrolled these patients during these years in these uh, gene therapy clinical trials and the patient stopped the cost for the program. So uh, our proposal is for the future when we came to the market. I will go there for the Minister of Health and show to them, uh, look at here, how much money we, we save. So maybe now we can treat a few other patients without needing to change in our budget. This can be a way to at least start. And once we have some successful case, this will actually help in terms of the budget. But of course, this will be a very expensive treatment and all depends is the durability of the expression and, and the successful of this expression to guarantee that this patient will not need any adjuvant treatment. Yeah, and I think so, uh, with, with hemophilia, you know, you're talking currently about a lifelong therapy. And so that if you can do something which will decrease those costs, it, it really is over potentially decades for some patients if you can do that. And you know, same thing for sickle cell. And there, same thing the for disease continues cell. continues to have medical problems on medical problems, and can affect their ability to be in the workforce and and so many other costs that get in, into it. That if you can do something which is yeah. really curative. Uh, that can mean so much for yeah. the quality of life, um, but it also can be a cost savings. And the challenge with trying to figure out what drug companies charge uh, is very challenging. I think the CAR-T initial one was based on what they thought it would cost for a transplant. So it had nothing to do probably with the cost of manufacturing um, the product. It, again, that's capitalism. So we'll, yeah. I'll leave it so there. I <laughs> yeah, I, I would just add to what Ken just said that, you know, the, the morbidity that is associated with the disease and the burden of the disease, you know, uh, and the annual healthcare costs of sickle treating 80,000 sickle cell disease patients in the United States is around $2 billion, you know, and if you add that and current lifespan of our sickle cell patients in our country is about 40 to 45 years. So, uh, you know, the costs basically, uh, if you give them therapy when they are children, they don't suffer all this morbidity and overall there is a decrease in the healthcare utilization. So that is one advantage, but I think things that will reduce the costs of this therapy are really, in my mind, uh, and it will not happen today, but it will happen maybe a decade from now, is that instead of putting genes into, for instance, CD34 positive cells, which only one in a hundred is a stem cell. You know, the rest are progenitors. So we are wasting so much virus that we are making a vector. You, you would be able to, for the same amount of vector, if you were able to transduce or put the genes into a more purified population, even a CD34 positive 38 negative, you that vector could go to 20 patients. You know, that vector is a huge cost. Then the second thing is that if you are able to, um, you know, do gene transfer in a very limited number of stem cells that you can actually expand for a few days, um, you know, so you can do one bone marrow aspirate instead of a massive two or three days of apheresis, that would reduce the cost. The third thing that will reduce the cost is actually uh, non-chemotherapy conditioning. You give them an antibody or a very small dose, they go home, they come back, they get their cells, they go home. And all those things will come, I think. It'll just take time. And uh, it definitely is the future uh, for gene therapy. We have another question for Dr. Azello. Um, someone asked, um, regarding to the immunogenicity to AAV against the hepatocytes, how would you have found out this issue in the preclinical phase of the study? Okay, this is also a quite good uh, question, but uh, but this was not predicted. The, the immunogen is the cellular uh, immune response that uh, I show in the case was not predicted in the 
either the, the mouse, the canine, or even the primate model uh, that was previously used in the, the preclinical phase. So, uh, but now, of course, we have uh, other models that help us to understand that this immunogenicity related to AEV can be way more complex and have several different pathways. But uh, in the beginning, this was not predicted in the preclinical yeah. trials. And maybe that's a shout out to some investigators or budding students and investigators there. There's a lot to be understood in. And these are challenging uh, because they are not the classic animal models to, to, to look at pharmacology and toxicology. So if there are people who are interested in this area, we definitely encourage you to, uh, to, to explore that and develop that because it, it could be a career, uh, certainly, and it could be very helpful for patients. I'm going to change topic because we got a little bit, we got a question about a topic that we haven't talked about today, but it relates to um, therapies for neurologic diseases, particularly Alzheimer's. And uh, I think maybe Dr. McIntyre, would, would you like to sort of give us a little idea of what's going on in that field? Yes. Um, so specifically as regards Alzheimer's, there have been there's one um, AAV-based trial that was initiated over 10 years ago, um, and I don't believe that that is something that is an active development anymore, um, but at this time, there are two additional active trials involving AAV gene therapy as well. Um, one is delivering the APOE4 gene and another one delivering HTERT. So um, that's just one. I think that right now um, within the neurological space, their, their AAV-based gene therapy is actually quite active. Um, there were also some various Parkinson's disease trials that have been initiated. And again, those were some of the legacy ones um, that uh, some of the earliest AV-based gene therapies that were started. Um, and then um, as regards the topic of this conversation for monogenic disorders, there is vibrant gene therapy in um, the space right now, including um, to address the unmet medical needs for uh, various mucopolysaccharidoses um, Huntington's disease and a variety of other neurological disorders. So it's, it's a hot space. Yeah. And for patient education um, there, if, if somebody's interested in that, um, the ASGC website at asgct.org slash education does have um, units for patients with Huntington's and Parkinson's, I believe. So I'm um, going explain some of that. And I think our friends, uh, at ASGC also said there is a um, Unicure for Huntington's disease trial that's listed on their clinical trials uh, site too. So um, if folks want to look a little bit more into that, there's, there's some resources there that the society can provide. So let's see. I guess if their folks don't have any other questions, I'm trying to go through the list here. Uh, I get the feeling that the questions came depending on what time zone people were on. So I try to look at them. Uh, so all right, I think what we'll, we'll go ahead. We're a little early, um, but if there's no other questions here. Uh, may I ask one question to Dr. Malik? Please. Yeah, uh, so my question is in terms of the selection and the eligibility of the patients. Of course, you touch in terms of that. And uh, uh, what do you think it will be for the future, the ideal age for this patient? And uh, when they have, because we wanted to, to, uh, to avoid that they develop a chronic systemic complications. So it will be the same as what we select the patients for bone marrow transplantations. What is your recommendations, at least for the future, not only for clinical trials? So um, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. So I think initial trials have to be done in adults, of course, because you need informed consent and they 
And so uh, our uh, trial was approved for six adults and then followed by a formal FDA review and uh, DSMB review to see if we can lower the age down to three years actually. Uh, so then it right now it's 18 to 45 years and then it would, you know, if there is safety and efficacy, uh, then uh, it would, they would allow the age to be lowered. In Boston, uh, in the Boston trial, they had proposed three tiers, you know, first doing, uh, you know, six adults and then six, 12 to 18 years and then below 12 years. Uh, but I personally believe that if they, if our trial, for instance, the phase one, two trial, they allow children and we see the sooner we go, the better it is. And we actually have saved uh, cord blood from some of our patients because they knew I'm working on gene therapy and the mother was pregnant with another child with sickle cell disease. We were already following one of the uh, children with sickle cell disease. And so um, she basically asked if we could save the cord blood and we have save the cord blood as GMP. And there is no reason why we couldn't use that to give to the child in the future as and when it gets approved. So I, um, I'm an optimist. I feel that once this therapy becomes, you know, uh, well tested and we have good safety data and efficacy data, there is no reason why infants couldn't get it, you know. Uh, just like the hydroxyurea story, it started with adults, then it went to children, and then the baby hug study. And now we have uh, at Cincinnati Children's, we are offering hydroxyurea at six to nine months of age in the TREAT study. And we have shown uh, fetal hemoglobin levels up to 40 to 50 percent because they never turn off their genes. So um, those results were presented, and I think they are uh, just recently published. So I think that uh, once we have, uh, of course, the bar for hemoglobinopathies or diseases where there is no immediate fatality is very high to reach children because you first have to demonstrate safety and efficacy in adults and then gradually go down to children. Uh, but uh, I would like to see infants treated with this disease in the future. Any other questions that have for each other? All right. If not, then I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Maritza McIntyre. Uh, uh, Dr. McIntyre uh, joined Stride Bio in April of 2020. <laughs> so hopefully you didn't have to travel very far to make those <laughs> changes, but uh, um, she's been a virologist for over 20 years. Uh, she's worked in development, evaluation, and regulation of a gene therapy. Uh, prior to Stride Bio, she was the president of Advanced Therapy Partners, um, an executive vice president of regulatory affairs and product development um, and gene therapy clinical project lead at uh, Bambo Therapeutics, which is a, a Pfizer associated company. Um, she's also been vice president of regulatory partners at uh, GenX Bio and chief of gene therapy branch at the US FDA. Um, so she's had lots of different, uh, different views of regulatory issues and we're very pleased that she could join us today. Uh, Dr. McIntyre. Thank you, Ken. Or do you see my screen? I'm just... Yes, we do. Okay, is it in? If you want to put it in, if you can put it into the full screen. Yeah. There. Perfect. Okay. Um, so thank you to um, ASGCT for inviting me to speak today. I'm excited to speak with um, our Brazilian colleagues in. Um, who are trying to um, develop gene therapy within Brazil and hopefully be the uh, Central American um, hub for, um, or Latin American hub for uh, gene therapy and help educate the rest of um, South and Central America. My mother is from Guatemala, so um, 
I feel a little bit of a kinship, even though, yes, you're, that's a Spanish speaking country and you're Portuguese, but I still feel that, that we're cousins. So I will be speaking to you, um, as Ken said, I, I have experience in um, gene therapy product development, both from actually starting, originating from the regulatory side and then transitioning over to um, both um, working within various AV gene therapy companies um, and as a consultant. So just an outline of my talk, I'll give it just a brief history of um, gene therapy development and, and, and the regulation and how that oversight has evolved within the United States. Um, some common themes in gene therapy are just general drug um, oversight, the roles that regulatory bodies play, um, and then go over some of the challenges in gene therapy development um, in terms of satisfying the regulatory requirements. So this slide here just gives you some selected highlights um, throughout um, the history of gene therapy, starting um, in the 1970s when the concept of gene therapy was first proposed. Um, at this point, this it was again conceptual. We were just entering an area where genes were able to be identified, but there were forward thinking scientists who could imagine that, um, that um, some of the viruses that they were identifying and studying or met, um, plasmids had been identified could be used to help to transfer um, a gene into a cell. The NIH um, and people within the scientific and um, you know, society, American society recognized the potential um, of this and, and had concerns in particular about um, any potential environmental concerns. And so the NIH Re recombinant DNA um, advisory committee was, was formed in the 1970s. The following decade um, actually saw quite an advance in the development of other types of vectors, including retroviral and AEV vectors, which um, AEV in particular has um, really exploded, but some of the um, first um, successes actually were um, done with retroviral vectors. At the same time, because of the success and the fact that um, from a uh, drug development standpoint, there was only beginning to be consideration of, of how one would regulate or if one would regulate this type of work, there was the first actual um, trial attempted and it did not go undergo any type of regulatory oversight. There was no real mechanism for it either. Um, at this time, we've spent a lot of time talking about different ways to engineer T cells. And um, from a research point of view, that type of work was just beginning in the 1980s, which gives you an idea. Someone talked about you know, how long it's taken to develop um, a gene therapy for, um, for sickle cell. But you know, the, <laughs> there's a lot of hits and misses and um, it's just, you know, that it, it takes a lot of dedication. Um, and so that's where the story of the CAR-Ts and other types of modified um, T cells to treat cancer started back in the 1980s. And at this time, um, the FDA published, or the NIH published their um, guidelines for recombinant DNA research. And among other things, those guidelines established the requirement for institutional biosafety committee review, um, which continues to this day. And it started the um, review of the protocols within um, and including any potential clinical protocols um, at NIH through the RAC. The 1980s saw the first approved human um, clinical trial of gene therapy, and that was for ADA SCID, um, as well as the first direct in vivo gene therapy trial, which involved plasmid. 
um, and the first um, FDA guidance document um, uh, outlining the conduct of um, gene therapy. The first um, real cure uh, was, was uh, involving in gene therapy was the ex-GID gene therapy trial conducted in France. Unfortunately, it was, um, as was alluded to, the first um, report of an insertional mutagenesis, which resulted in leukemia in, those in some of those patients and, and subsequently in patients treated um, for other, um, other um, diseases uh, using the retroviruses, which really helped pave the way for the replacement with a lentiviral gene therapy um, subsequent, soon after that. Um, just moving on, um, those in terms of regulatory guidance as well, um, that led to the um, the release by FDA of the long-term follow-up guidance. AEV gene therapy really came into the fore in the 2010s with the first promising um, hemophilia data um, and approval of an AE gene therapy for um, in the EU for a lipo metabolism disease. Um, by the late 2010s, we'd seen um, approval of an ADA skid gene therapy and um, the CAR first CAR T's and um, AAV based gene therapies for blindness and spinal muscular atrophy. And in this, um, actually, just this year has been a busy year. Um, there was the first um, in vivo gene editing with CRISPR attempted. Um, FDA has um, finalized six new cell and gene therapy guidances, including some updates to the long-term follow-up guidance, as well as guidances on um, CMC and the retroviral um, art, retrovirus um, replication competent retrovirus testing. Um, there has been a lot of predictions about the number, uh, you know, an increasing pace of approvals for gene therapies. But in fact, in this year, we saw um, that FDA um, declined to approve at this time Biomarin's um, AV gene therapy for hemophilia A, as was mentioned previously, due to some durability questions. And uh, several other late stage gene therapy programs in the US have actually um, reported delays due to um, CMC issues that they have encountered. And these are generally related to, there's been a lot of talk and I'll go through some of the ideas of stage specific GMP, but um, the, a lot of these delays are really due to the fact that as one progresses to um, commercial manufacturing, the um, requirements for GMP would become much more stringent. Um, and so this is um, where some of the um, maybe in the manufacturing process and, and quality control development has lagged behind or failed to keep pace with the demonstration of cl clinical efficacy. And so that's now they're needing to slow those programs down to, get, to do the catch up work that's needed to support a licensure. This here, which may be a little bit difficult for you to read, but basically I alluded to the fact that in um, early oversight um, of, of recombinant DNA research within the um, United States was initiated um, and overseen by the NIH um, recombinant DNA advisory committee. And what that means is that by the time the FDA um, established a regulatory framework to um, oversee recombinant DNA related um, clinical development, they shared a responsibility with for oversight of those trials 
with um, the NIH RAC. This resulted in um, a situation where there was a requirement for any um, investigators to not only submit information to FDA, but they also had to submit information to the, uh, to the NIH RAC. Um, and over the years, that the level of um, scrutiny within the RAC um, waned, um, where they went from calling every single um, program up for protocol review um, to, to a point where um, in the early 2000s, they were selecting only certain protocols that had critical issues. And then finally, in 2018, um, there was a decision that was made that sufficient information and expertise was um, available within the FDA so that this um, dual oversight was no longer needed. And so I guess I would liken that to um, within um, uh, Brazil, it was mentioned that you have a regional group of experts um, who form a CAT. That's also the case in, in Europe. But within the United States at this time, um, the, the expertise is held within the FDA and that oversight is um, uniquely um, within the FDA. Of course, there are the ethical um, requirements that still require the IRB review within each institution, which is where the clinical research is being done, who are tasked with, um, with uh, approving any given trial um, with, that is done within their institution, and also the um, biosafety, institutional biosafety, which is more of a um, sort of environmental issue that, so those are still um, regulatory requirements, but those are outside of, of the clinical development in, in a sense of, of the um, federal oversight. So each country uh, or region has their own regulatory set of um, laws um, governing the approval of drugs and other um, foods, et cetera. But I would say that there are some commonalities within them. And one of them is this need to balance um, a recognized need for innovation to help improve um, public health, and, and but while balancing patient safety at the same time. And so I've just sort of included here some quotes from the FDA, EMA, and MVSA websites that speak to that balance. Um, all of that um, in general, um, with that, within most regional um, regulatory bodies, the, the types of information that are collected to, in consideration of a clinical um, trial for gene therapy or any other biologic or chemical drug are similar. And um, there is a, um, a harmonized um, trial application or marketing application, which in the US we also use that same marketing application structure um, for the review of a, a clinical trial application. And so this essentially consists of three parts, information on the chemistry manufacturing and control of the product, um, which should be um, done in compliance with the good manufacturing practices, uh, the non-clinical information, so these are the um, in vitro and in vivo studies that were done um, in in vivo and animals that are done to support both the proof of concept and safety, and those safety trials should be done typically in conformance with good laboratory practices. And then um, the clinical study information, including protocol, consent forms, et cetera, and typically, um, again, the conduct of the trials are um, should be in compliance with good clinical practices. And in general, these what we call GXPs are, are norms and standards that outline, um, you know, how studies are conducted and 
put an emphasis on um, perspective um, designs, um, documentation, and then quality oversight. Again, in each region, there are laws regulate and regulations that outline what needs to be done. And then the different authorities typically will put out guidelines um, that are specific for different types of products or address specific issues to help you um, to help developers um, understand um, how to comply with the laws and regulations. And in addition to any regional um, guidelines, there are also guidelines from the International Con Conference of Harmonization, which are intended to um, simplify um, development from, you know, internationally by not, you know, having the developers have to meet completely different requirements from one region to the next. So next I'll go over some of the challenges for meeting the CMC requirements. So typical information to include in a clinical trial application would include description of the product, which for a gene therapy would include, you know, what the transgene and regulatory elements are within a vector, um, a, a sequence of um, verification that you have the, the sequences you think you have, and not anything extra, and um, the cell source, especially if it's an ex vivo product. Um, there should be a description of the manufacturers involved in producing the drug substance and the drug product, any critical raw materials, including things like your producer cell line or plasmids, um, and manufacturers involved in the release testing. Information should be provided about the facility and, um, and means to control the facility where this manufacturing of the drug is happening. And then um, what type of quality oversight you have. So quality oversight is really important for you know, um, verifying that um, manufacturing is and testing are done uh, per the specifications and to ensure that the facilities are operating as intended. Um, so just going into a little bit more detail in the description of the manufacturing process really should give a good description of um, how your critical raw materials, for example, your plasmids or your producer cells, how are those manufactured? Because they in themselves involve um, um, processes that are prone to contamination or um, mix up. And, and so they need often to have as rigorous a testing program as your final product. And that does need to be included in your application. Um, as you, especially as, as um, production um, continues through, as you gain more information and understanding of your process uh, as you produce more and more lots, you should be able to describe to the regulatory authorities which critical, which steps within your process are really critical to achieve um, the desired product quality. And um, just you need to provide a description of the type of container which in which you're putting your um, product and how it is that you're filling because aseptic filling is um, a necessity. Um, for, uh, in terms of um, testing, you need to, de to describe how it is you plan the sample. So for example, for your sterility test, you have to, um, to have a really valid and meaningful result. You have to sample a sufficient number of, of um, vials or lots of uh, containers that you fill. Um, you need to describe the different um, test methods that you're using and their acceptance criteria. And then particularly for um, products that are going to be stored long-term, many times people will make a big lot of their lentivirus, for example, for producing a CAR-T or, a, um, you know, a, for ex skid or, or um, other ex vivo cell therapies um, 
and it could last for years, especially for some of these rare diseases where you're waiting for patients. And so you need to have a program in place to ensure that um, the that 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 lentivirus, or if it is you know something for direct administration, that it remains viable over long-term storage, or if um, you are shipping, then the same would go for your final transduced cells. Do those need to be taken, you know, to the um, from harvest straight to the patient within a matter of hours? Can you freeze them and ship them? Those are all. All, whatever you do needs to be supported by stability data. Um, and then the purity is an issue for all drugs, but for um, you know a cell or a gene therapy product, it just becomes a lot more complex. There are many different process residuals that could remain, including the DNA or protein from the host cell where you propagate the plasmid DNA that you might use to make an AV vector or a lentiviral vector, um, column leachates from um, if you're that you might use to purify a specific cell type or your vector, et cetera. There's also contaminants that could arise. For the most part, the, ve the viral vectors that are used for gene therapy are replication incompetent but there is a potential for recombination events to happen that would render them replication competent again. Other viruses could be introduced either through um, serum that is used or if, you know, hopefully in a GMP space, you have um, appropriate um, um, HVAC so, and that you would not be adventitiously introducing any, but it is something that you need to confirm. And similarly, there is always the potential for bacteria or mycoplasma to enter and for you to then maybe subsequently have endotoxin. A big challenge in the gene therapy space is um, the development of a potency assay. Potency measures are important, um, a release criteria for drug products, and they are supposed to reflect the intended biological effect of your product. This becomes a lot more challenging for gene therapies because they need, obviously, to be product specific and related to the specific transgene that you are transferring to the patient. Sometimes it could be difficult to, to develop an ass, such an assay. For example, if you're expressing a structural protein like dystrophin, what type of um, in vitro cell method that is amenable to um, you know, your typical QC controlled lab could you actually develop? Um, and regulators will often allow early phase trials to begin where, without having such a, um, an assay in effect. The concern is that you could end up, you know, at late stage, never having produced one, developed an assay. And that is what has been reported to be the delay for one um, gene therapy for um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy that was reported this year. So, um, I mentioned earlier, uh, there were a lot of people who, um, who have spoken about their GMP um, facilities that they've established within their institutions. And this is really fantastic. Um, it has led to uh, academic institutions instituting, um, you know, some functions that might not normally be within a university, including your regulatory quality units, et cetera. Um, one thing to note, though, is that they're typically not facilities that, or well, the practices within them. I shouldn't speak to the facility themselves, but oftentimes the the the, the compliance, the GMP compliance, does not go far enough to support a licensure, and and this is um, by design. Most regulatory authorities have. Um, they do mandate that in even early phase investigational drugs should um, pro be produced following GMPs 
and that's to ensure patient safety. However, um, the regulations do allow for what would, would call a phase appropriate GMP practice. And within the US, um, in the 2000s, actually the regulations were, the federal regulations were actually amended to exempt certain phase one INDs completely from the GMP regulations that um, govern licensed products. And instead the FDA issued a guidance document um, for phase one GMPs. And the emphasis there is really placed on the prevention of con contamination, cross-contamination, sterility assurance, um, the use of qualified assay methods and quality oversight and documentation. And um, the EU similarly, um, you know, uh, mentions that um, there does not need to be complete um, GMP compliance because that generally by um, licensure, what GMP compliance includes is validation of everything that you do, your processes, your, your assay methods, your facility. And so um, those are not um, expected at an early phase. So how does one ensure compliance during early phase cl um, clinical trials? I, it really comes down to what I would call quality. You need to do a risk assessment of everything you do. And so for example, for your raw materials, um, do a risk assessment about what, where uh, could the possible areas of risk come from. In the past few years, because of the expense, many academic um, sponsors were using research grade um, plasmids to manufacture their lenti or AAB vectors, but they did so without a real understanding of how their supplier was manufacturing manufacturing those plasmids. And it turns out that they were being manufactured in areas where everything, you know, there was no segregation. Um, there was not necessarily any changeover of equipment or cleaning of equipment between um, manufacturing of one research grade plasmid versus another. And there were reports of um, cross-contamination when a sponsor um, did check their research-grade plasmid stock. So those are the types of things that you need to think about. Where, you know, where is it that you need to put most of your effort? And what the only way to know is, for example, to ask those questions of your suppliers. And so I would really recommend that you establish um, acceptance criteria for your critical raw materials, audit your vendors, which it could be just a questionnaire, or if you have that bandwidth to actually go do expense, um, you know, audits on site. Um, and to have within your organization, some sort of quality assurance oversight. Sometimes my experience is that, um, there is a tension between a, a PI or, or the person who's involved in manufacturing. Um, they, there's a pressure there or, um, that you need a little bit more of a disinterested party who might say this, you know, there was a problem, the risks are too high, maybe we need to scrap this lot. Um, and so usually within a commercial organization, that it, quality oversight is some, is separate in the, in a line of command from manufacturing, and it's a good thing to try to establish something similar with even within an academic setting. Um, assays might not need to be validated, but they should be scientifically sound. Otherwise, the information you're getting is meaningless. We've seen this, and FDA has actually started to require validation of the assays that are used to um, titer AAV products because that is the dose determining assay. And it has been found that there could be differences from um, one assay to another that are as much as a log. And now that we know that there are dose dependent toxicities um, with AAV, then that becomes a problem. And I already talked about cross-contamination, but the ways to avoid that are to do campaign manufacturing and just keep things segregated. Um, this is just in the US, some guidance documents that are available. 
Um, so next, moving on to preclinical, the role of the preclinical studies is really to inform the scientific basis for your proposed clinical trial, um, including and importantly, what might be an effective dose, what is the best route of administration to get your gene to your target organ. Um, another very important role of um, preclinical studies is really to uh, establish what your safe starting dose and escalation scheme might be, identify potential targets of toxicity, and which will tell you what might be important to monitor clinically, and to even maybe to um, identify an eligible patient population. So these type of assays could be in vitro to confirm that your, your transgene product is functional and that you get phenotypic correction. And this might be especially important using, for example, patient-derived cells if there's no good animal model of disease. Um, in vivo studies can be used to demonstrate um, that you are getting tissue-specific transduction and gene expression um, and to look at your distribution on off-target organs. Um, this is true for viral vector based and also, for example, gene editing off targets are important to understand. Although many times um, for gene editing, um, if you, if it, it's sequence specific, and so you might get most of your information more from a patient derived cell. Um, toxicology study is the pivotal IND enabling study. Again, it's going to identify your air, potential areas of toxicity um, and their durability or reversibility. And they're really important to inform the risk benefit um, to start a phase one study. And typically these studies must be GLP compliant. Um, but some of the considerations one has to take for gene therapies, whether or not um, your you know, the studies need to be performed in a biologically relevant model because you will not get meaningful um, efficacy or uh, proof of concept or safety data in the, if you use, introduce your product into a species in which the transgene or the virus are not active. Um, so those are questions that you need to ask yourself to justify um, the use of a particular um, species. Also, um, in cases where you are going to be, for example, using a route of administration such as intracoronary or into, um, like into intrathecal, you have to be able to conduct your studies in a way where you can model the intended route of administration, in particular for your talk studies. Um, and so while at least in the US and, and the EU, there's not an a priori requirement for two species toxicology as there is um, with um, chemically based drugs, you do need to think about um, whether or not um, you might need to add a different species simply to be able to model your route of administration. So just, again, some of the um, design considerations. Um, you might have to use an analogous product um, for this is in particular, this could be the case in particular, if you have um, a transgene that is not um, active in your species, for example, many cytokines, human cytokines are not active in mice, or if, for example, you have a gene editing product where um, it's, you know, you need sequence specificity, but you could use an analogous um, set of guide RNA, for example, um, for proof of concept and or even to um, some, in some instances for talks to look for off target. Um, it could be a useful adjunct. Um, Talk studies should be done, um, when you do a talk study, the, the material you use should be manufactured using a process that is reflective of that. 
that you're going to use in the clinical trial because really what your the talk study is supposed to be um, developing, you know, a, a picture of um, any potential toxicities with the product, which could go beyond your um, material itself, but um, the transgene or the vector, but could be related to um, formulations or um, residuals that could vary based on the process. Um, there is, you know, within the international community an awareness that we should try to um, reduce animal use as much as possible. And so there's the, um, what is called the three hours to reduce, replace, or refine studies. And so there is, um, FDA um, really does recommend that you try to get as much information out of your animal studies as you can, including um, incorporating safety endpoints into some um, proof of concept and dose ranging studies. Um, um, and you can also combine, so uh, you need to do shedding studies to support a clinical trial. You could do those as part of your, um, uh, you could look at shedding and biodistribution in proof of concept studies as well. So, um, sometimes I see that people have only, for example, done a survival study with their gene transfer. And I always think it's a shame that they didn't just go ahead at sacrifice and, and take organs and look at, um, you know, biodistribution or gene expression. And instead they're saving that for a later study. Um, and so FDA does recommend hybrid proof of concept talk studies in an animal model of disease um, for efficiency. That can provide challenges, for example, because many times those models are not available to a CRO. And so there could be a challenge in terms of um, doing them within um, GLP compliant settings, but both FDA and EMA provide um, considerations for deviations for um, GLPs, for um, ATMPs, and you just need to provide a rationale. I've just included here just a couple, two different examples of cases where um, studies were not done, the, the development plan was not exactly within the norm um, and how those were handled. And, and these are both um, products for which um, INDs were eventually allowed. And so one of them was an AV-based LDL receptor gene therapy for the treatment of homozygous familial hypocholesteremia. Um, the minimally effective dose of the vector expressing the human LDLR gene was higher than analog an analogous vector expressing the mouse um, LDLR gene. And this was presumed to be due to a um, lower affinity for ApoB using the human LDLR gene in a mouse. And so what was worked out with FDA was that um, a toxicology study would be done using the analogous mouse vector. So that was not really the clinical candidate. There was just one cohort that was treated at a very high dose only um, with the actual clinical candidate. Um, and the additional safety data came using the actual clinical candidate just in a small number of monkeys. This is a different, also AAV-based um, uh, example. In this case, it was a mouse model of disease in which only the transduced cells are corrected. The novel capsid did not transduce mouse tissue at all. Um, but the human gene product actually was active in mouse cells. Um, and so the human and dose ranging was performed with using the human gene, but in an, a, a capsid that was capable of transducing mouse tissue. Um, and safety endpoints were incorporated into that dose finding study. Um, transduction efficiency necessary to ameliorate um, was correlated to dose. And then um, a GFP expressing vector with that novel capsid was used to determine the dose needed to achieve a equivalent transduction in non-human primates. Um, and then um, 
the combination of the novel capsid with the human transgene was used then using the doses whoops, um, identified um, from this sort of bridging with the GFP study to do the tox. So these are just examples where, you know, nothing in gene therapy is ever straightforward, but there are ways around, you know, working with regulators, you can find ways to gather the information that is needed. Um, this is just an outline of some points from FDA of some of the common deficiencies in talk studies. Um, and just to speed through here, I'll just move on to um, some common issues in gene therapy for, um, from a clinical point of view. These have been assessed before or discussed previously. Pre-existing immunity could be to um, AEV, for example, the transgene cytokine storm for CAR-Ts, um, to the transgene itself, for example, as was alluded to as a possibility with hemophilia A. Um, and then there have been liver and complement activation issues identified with high-dose gene therapy. Um, and then the need for long-term follow-up data, which can go out as far as 15 years for any type of re retrovirus or gene editing. Um, from a trial design standpoint, endpoint selection is often a concern due to poorly understood disease natural history, um, diseases where there's a really slow degenerative process, so you might not be treating patients at the state, same stage of disease, so it's hard to assess efficacy. Um, or when there's a multifactorial etiology, for example, for heart disease. Um, small patient populations can result in enrollment as it delays and make it difficult to include um, control arms. And then many rare diseases do affect um, predominantly pediatric populations, but there are ethical issues um, that challenge how one gets to enroll uh, children. Again, some selected gene therapy guidance documents. And thank you, I've gotten way over time. Um, uh, <clears throat> Dr. McIntyre, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> there are, it, it points out that there can be a lot of uh, <laughs> roadblocks on the way, but you can get over them. And, yeah. and what I have found that it's important to, to speak with the regulators. Um, and, yes. and the earlier you do it, the better um, to be able to do it, because I think there is a recognition that many of these things are new and they just don't have the infrastructure there, or there's just not the animal model, other things that would be there. Um, yes. But I also find they're very data driven. So having a rationale, um, making sure it's something that if particularly around safety that you feel comfortable going forward with. Um, but then talking with them because they may know something you don't know also. Yes, that's true. Um, but at, you're right. I think data is, is what will win the day. Yeah. Um, and I, I was told by an FDA person once that you're the expert. Don't ask us what to do. You need to tell <laughs> us that we have to be comfortable with it or not. So I think it's yeah. important in yeah. these things for you to realize that you, you have to think through it first and then learn. Yes. Exactly. Um, we did have a couple of questions here, um, and I think they, one of it was, uh, how does the FDA assess literature data as a support for not carrying out preclinical data with a specific product? Or I guess do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they, it depends. So I, I, they, they often will, cons you know, I don't think that you can ever get out of doing any preclinical studies, but FDA can and will um, accept a publication, you know, a, a published manuscript as um, rather than having you rewrite out what it is that you, you know, the studies that you did, but they're going to look at them in much in the same way, maybe, you know, the journal, you know, the, the reviewers did and, um, and so it depends on the strength of the data. So you could, you know, maybe get something published, but it's the very, you know, maybe you couldn't get it published in molecular therapy, but you got it published in, you know, I don't know, I don't want to disparage any um, journals, but, you know, it, 
it's going to depend on the strength of the data. I guess I, from an investigative standpoint, I want to make sure that if they came knocking on the door for an audit, that I had all the data there for them well, to review. Exactly. And so I think that's another point that um, I, I, at least within the FDA, but I'm sure it's the case in all regulatory um, jurisdictions is that when you, um, when you bank it, when you submit an application, you are actually signing and, 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 you know, um, confirming that you did something. And so I think one of the challenges is when you think about, well, you know, something that you published in a, um, in a journal because it was an academic exercise, you know, part of research, your research is, is whether or not you did document it in a way that is, would be, you, you know, acceptable or would pass muster if someone were, if a regulatory body were to come. And um, because I've had that experience where I, I try to assemble, you know, the work that was described by an academic and it's, well, this computer died and this, and then, you know, then that's not good enough because you, that you do have to have the access to the source documents. Yeah. And, and I think your points were well taken about trying to combine efficacy and um, and some safety issues because it's not uncommon for investigators to want to go and they have great animal data and FDA looks and says, yeah, you'd have great efficacy data. What about these six animals that died? What yeah. happened to those? And, and then you, yeah, and that's a hold issue could be. So mm -hmm. um, for folks out there who are doing these experiments, if you have animals die when you're doing these things that you intend to support, going forward with a clinical study, you got to understand what happened to them and be able to answer it. Um, so, yeah. but anyway, there's another question here that said, could you detail a little about analytical method validation during clinical development? Yeah, so there's, an act there's actually an ICH guidance document that is, applies to all drugs and, and generally does pertain to the analytical methods that one would use um, even to release a gene therapy product. And they, they go, they deal with things like re reproducibility, um, interoperator variation, et cetera. And so a lot of that is, those are things that you're going to um, need to really um, establish and define by the time a product is marketed and would be undergoing a routine um, use in a QC laboratory. But even earlier on, there's what one might call qualification or we call like small V validation versus big V validation in that you really should understand, um, you know, what are the limits of detection of your assay? you should have some idea of what the variability is, the linearity, because otherwise you, it, you're you doing a test and reporting a result that might not have much meaning. So you really, you know, those are some things that you, you do, you should try to understand. For example, if you're testing for a residual, but your test isn't very sensitive and you're reporting non-detected, well, you know, <laughs> It, it maybe it's not meaningful. So I, I would say that even early on, those are some of the types of things that you need to be looking into and establishing. So we've got one last question. Um, and it is, how is the FDA's interact, how is the FDA's interaction with companies and approval of clinical trials with gene therapy? And it said uh, in parentheses, IND submission. They also said, how is this process in non-clinical development? I'm not sure about that last one, but I guess. So maybe I'll just explain a little bit that when you're, um, so if a, a, a sponsor, and it could be a clin an academic or a company, when you're developing um, a gene therapy, there are several opportunities to, um, to um, communicate with the FDA along the way. So prior to submitting, um, 
a clinical trial application, which we call an IND. Um, and you, you can, well, specifically with for gene therapies and cell and gene therapies, there is something with um, that that office offers that's called an interact meeting. And that is a, a meeting that is specifically for issues where maybe you're developing, um, you know, a, a very novel uh, approach where the, the available guidance is just not going to really help you decide what your best preclinical approach might be. Maybe there's absolutely no animal model, or maybe you want to use a new model. Um, say there was a new model for hemophilia developed. That I don't know what it could be. Maybe it's a new mouse that can actually predict if there's going to be liver tox, but it's never been used before. So you may ask for what's called an interact meeting. Um, to have discussions with the FDA about whether or not that model might be suitable. As you go further along in development where you've already maybe done your um, proof of concept studies that have allowed you then to decide what you want your clinical trial to look like. So you have a draft clinical protocol design, you have, um, you're, you've identified how you're going to manufacture and test your pr product, then you can submit to have what's called a pre-IND meeting. And at that point, FDA will, you, you describe everything and you, you pose questions to the FDA and they meet with you and they will answer those questions. And that helps you de-risk your um, clinical trial so that when you then submit your um, application, you, you have less chance of them putting you on hold. So that's the way that that those are your opportunities to interact with the FDA before you submit an IND. And then once you submit your IND, they have 30 days to review it and either allow you to proceed or put you on clinical hold, in which case they will send you a letter and tell you what you need to fix. Great. And I think one of the questions just popped up, but you just answered it. So it's perfect. Oh, okay. Um, so one, I think, uh, I'd like to turn it over uh, doc, to Dr. Han again, but from my standpoint, just uh, wanted to thank everybody that was on the uh, participating and giving talks and all those folks that were listening uh, on over the, the internet. So Dr. Han. Oh, hello, I, I just want to thank you again for our speakers and uh, as you see this stuff in the audience. I just like to uh, inform about the next annual meeting in Brazil, which will be in April 28th through May 1st, which will be held virtually. In this meeting, we'll have again uh, one joint meeting with ASUCT, which is very nice. So I hope all of you can participate in this meeting again. So I just want to thanks again and just bye bye. And yeah, please fill out the evaluations and both how oh, yeah, we can sure. help this with this and other th ways that the societies can interact and help folks uh, move their research and their clinical trials along. So great. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.